as Kerala, University of Kerala and University of Exeter UK, University of Zulu and South Africa. Supported by Ministry of Earth Science, Government of India. It gives us immense pleasure to provide a golden opportunity to all of us to discuss geoscience, learn new methods and interact with global audience even though we are geographically far apart. The research presentations are expected to ignite innovative ideas and bring up some exciting questions, opening plethora of options for both our students and research community. We look forward to an exposure about what some of the best of the brains want to say in this context. We invite all the participants and eminent speakers across the globe to this grand event. With this brief introduction, let's move on to the inaugural session. I now invite Dr. Lindo Alapart, convener, organizing committee, also the head of the Department of Geology and Environmental Science, Christ College Autonomous, to welcome the gathering. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Ms. Asha. Your mic is mute, sir. Thank you. A very good day to everyone. I thought it would be appropriate to greet everyone with a good day as we are connected through this platform across different time zones from various countries. Though this is a welcome address, let me begin with a note of thanks to the God Almighty in making it possible for me to sit before you today to welcome you all to the seven days of fruitful discussions and deliberations on various topics over the online platform. Welcome to the International Geoscience Colloquium, jointly organized by Christ College Autonomous Irinalakuda, Kerala, India, University of Kerala, India, University of Exeter, UK, and University of Sululand, South Africa, and supported by Ministry of Earth Sciences, Government of India. We have, for this colloquium, 29 speakers from over 14 countries and 29 institutions across the world presenting their research. A number of emerging research areas in geoscience are to be discussed in this program on various topics under three major themes, such as new proxies of climate change of the past and the present, Geohazards mitigation, management, and development in stratigraphy and sedimentology, big data analysis, artificial intelligence in geoscience, geoscience and integrated reservoir modeling. The chairs of various sessions will be giving a brief overview on what you can expect in the next few days in each session. The aim of this colloquium is to overcome the barrier created by travel ban due to the COVID-19 pandemic and the vacuum created in the teaching learning space for both the researchers and students. The, the deliberations will be helpful in spreading the word about the cutting edge research in the wide areas of geoscience for the benefit of graduate students and early career researchers. As we know the spirit of knowledge is contagious and we invite you to spread it for the good. With this virtual gathering, the organizers felt that our students need an exposure to what is happening in the research world and to meet the people who write these high impact factor journals, journal articles and bring new inventions into the subject area. To those who are invited to give presentations, I hope you have a rejuvenating experience in meeting young minds waiting to be molded. Let me go into my duty of welcoming all gathered here. Let me welcome the chief guest of the day, Professor Jodi Ranjan S. Ray, Director of, Na of National Center for Earth Science Studies, Kerala, India, who is, in spite of his busy schedule, is here amongst us to give inaugural address. I welcome you, sir, to this meeting. Christ College Principal, Dr. Jolly Andrews, whose continuous support has made this program possible. 
I welcome you, sir, to this program. I would like to welcome Father Jacob Nirnambuli, CMI Manager, Christ College, who is always giving his support in spreading the spirit of knowledge to a wider student community beyond the borders of the institution among an international audience. I also welcome Professor Nakatula Winfred Kunene, Dean of the Faculty of Science and Agriculture, University of Zululand, South Africa. This program is jointly organized by University of Zululand in continuation of the commitment as per the MOU signed with Christ College to collaborate in academic and research activities between University and Zululand. Now, I would like to welcome Dr. Angela Galeo Sala, University of Exeter, UK, who is the co-chair of the first session and has really worked hard in making this program a reality. I welcome you, ma'am, to this program. I also welcome Dr. Sajin Kumar KS, University of Kerala, India, and adjunct assistant professor, Michigan State University, USA, who has accepted my request to co-organize co and chair the session on geohazards. I welcome you, sir. Dr. Saju Manacheri, Georeservoir Solutions from Perth, Australia, is the alumnus of our department and has agreed to co-organize and chair the third session. It is my proud privilege to welcome you, Dr. Saju, to this meeting. I would like to welcome my friend and collaborator, Dr. Ermelai Vetramurugan from University of Sululand, South Africa, who has come forward to organize this program and will also be chairing a session in the program. I welcome dear Vetri. I would like to welcome my colleagues, each and everyone in the Department of Geology and Environmental Science who have worked tirelessly with me to make this event possible. Thank you. I welcome all of you to this program. I would like to welcome all the participants across India and other countries who have come online to attend this program. I hope this colloquium will create more questions than answers in your minds and let these questions instill in you an interest in finding answers to these questions through research. With these words, may I conclude? Thank you. I welcome you one and all once again. Thank you, sir. Let me now invite Reverend Father Dr. Jolie Andrews, Principal Christ College Autonomous, as well as the Organizing Committee Chairman for the Presidential Address. Over to you, Father. Hello, I think all of you can hear and see me. Yes, Father. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Father Jacob Nerinambili, the Honorable Manager of the Christ College, Professor Nokuthula Winfred from the University of the Sululand. The inaugural that has been the inaugural session that has been the inauguration that has been done by the director, National Center for the Earth Science Studies, Professor Jodi Rangan Yesre from the Ministry of Earth Science, Government of India. Dr. Lindo Alapath, the convener by the organizing committee. And we have a host of very eminent personalities who are here for this International Geoscience Colloquium, which has been organized by the Christ College in Yalakoda in association with the University of Exeter and University of Sululand. They are eminent researchers respected faculty members, scientists, friends, and the benefactors of the benefactors of our college. It is with immense pride and gratitude I am here to speak a few words in this international colloquium, the international colloquium about the geoscience. I'm very happy to note that for our inaugural address itself, we have got a Professor Jodhirengan Yesway, 
the director from the National Center for the Earth Science to his Ministry of Earth Science Government of India. And when I look into the resource persons, I can find the resource persons are from the different countries. A host of the countries, and that way it is a truly an international conference. It's not just one or two. We have got a lot many resource persons. And I learned from the organizing committee that there are more than 1,000 registrations for this truly international colloquium. And the participants from a different countries, around 17, 18 countries, are participating in this international colloquium. Here I would like to make a few words of appreciation to the University of Exeter and the University of Sululand. We already signed a memorandum of understanding with the University of Sululand. And we are very happy to move forward with the research topics, with the research forums of, the, forums of the discussions that has to be done as a part of this memorandum of understanding. I will place a few words about Avran College, the Christ College in Yalakoda in Kerala. It was started in the year 1956 by the visionary father, Padmabhushan, Father Kapri. And from the right inspiration which our college has got, we have grown into one of the epicenters as far as the academic quality and the research has been concerned. And we are very happy And we are happy, we are very happy to note that we have gone or moved forward in a wonderful manner. And I sincerely appreciate the Department of Geology and the Environmental Science for conducting this international webinar, this international colloquium of such a great magnitude. The Christ College Irinyalakoda has at present for about 4,000 students in their enrollment list. And perhaps the largest number of the students as far as the state of Kerala has been concerned. Having 29 UG courses and a host 17 PG courses and having research in 11 departments. Perhaps we are given a leading role as far as the research activities of the Kerala has been concerned. I place my special appreciation to Dr. Lindu Alapart, the HOD of the Department of Geology and Environmental Science. I also space my special thanks to Dr. Vitri Murugan Elumele from the University of Sululand, South Africa, who is perhaps one of our best friends. We have got special appreciation to us, the advisory committee members, including Professor A.K. Singhvi, the Vice President from the Indian National Science Academy, Professor Dr. Manfred Frenchen from the Leibniz Institute for the Applied Geophysics, Germany, and Professor Yen Ilango from the Department of Geology, Anna University, Chennai. And I wholeheartedly appreciate the organizing committee, the organizing team, and the entire faculty members of the Department of Geology and Environmental Science, and to, in a very special manner, Dr. Lindo Alapat in taking all the pains in order to organize this wonderful international colloquium. Have a wonderful time. Have a nice time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Father. Now we move on to the inauguration. Let me now invite Professor Jodi Ranjan Esrae, Director, National Center for Earth Science Studies, Kerala, for the inaugural address. I welcome you, sir. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, Dr. Father Jali Andrews, Professor Lukutala Kunune from Jululand, Father Jacob, Dr. Linto Alapat, ladies and gentlemen. It is my great pleasure to welcome you all on behalf of the Ministry of Art Sciences, Government of India, to this virtual International Geosciences Colloquium being organized by the Christ College of Iriana Lakuda. Kerala. I'm sorry if I don't pronounce it correctly. Uh, I also welcome all the eminent speakers of today 
for all future sessions as well and all participants of this uh, colloquium. Uh, in this time of pandemic, uh, through virtual conferences, uh, I mean, they are inevitable. However, in my view, uh, these are the best uh, forum, forums to actually meet and uh, discuss scientific activities with people whom you otherwise may not be able to see or talk to. So I'm, I'm pretty sure this conference or this colloquium would be a great success. I see a lot of young people around and I'm through this, I think, it, I thought it is five days, but looks like it is seven days conference. So uh, I'm sure a lot of activities will be happening. And uh, if I get time, I'll definitely come in and uh, listen to some of the lectures. I have already marked them. Uh, in any case, uh, here we are uh, for this conference and uh, uh, the topics are very interesting and timing. Uh, I mean, depending on, uh, I don't know the expertise people have in this uh, uh, department, but this department definitely has grown into a big department with a lot of PG courses as well. I'm very happy to note uh, that uh, people whom I, I knew personally have uh, become heads of department and are doing, I mean, doing great in research as well as in teaching. And they are encouraging the young scientists to take up geosciences as a subject, which is very heartening for me at least. Uh, the, the subject areas that uh, would be covered in this colloquium is uh, climate studies, geohazards, stratigraphy and sedimentology, reservoir engineering, and uh, most interestingly, artificial intelligence in geosciences. I would like to attend it. Let's see, I mean, I have, I have very limited knowledge of this, but I'm sure i will be benefited by some of these interesting talks. As far as uh, the ministry is concerned, we are more of a service ministry because uh, if you have noticed, Ministry of Art Science uh, caters to the needs of the country in the sense uh, like uh, all weather departments, Indian Meteorological uh, Ministry and uh, seismic uh, hazards. And uh, there are a lot of oceanography departments. Uh, they are all in uh, Ministry of Art Sciences. So we basically provide services to the government in order to, uh, the, for the societal needs mostly. Research is also a component, but it is mostly restricted to certain organizations like ours, which is located in Tiruvananthapuram. Uh, as you may already know, Indian subcontinent is home to some of the spectacular landforms and structures. Uh, unfortunately, last year, the International Geo uh, Geoscience Con uh, Congress was supposed to be held in Delhi, which could not happen because of COVID. Uh, I am not sure when it is going to be held, but most likely it will happen next year. That is what I have been told. So maybe we'll get an opportunity to meet people from various countries and experts and discuss them with, uh, uh, in, a, in a close manner. Nonetheless, uh, the country as such is geologically and climatically very diverse and has a very long geological history right from Archean to the present day. The records preserved in the rocks of the subcontinent uh, can reveal or will, I mean, have been revealing uh, many inter interesting aspects of the geological history or the evolution of the planet as a whole. They preserve records of early evolution of life and they preserve records of volcanism, continent formation, and uh, mountain formation as well as evolution of life as such. And of course, uh, the, the spectacular features like uh, uh, Himalayas uh, uh, are there for everyone to see, not only do research, but also for tourism purpose. Okay, uh, so therefore I am pretty sure young minds who will be attending this will be highly benefited by the discussions and the lectures by experts in the field. And they will, uh, if they are not already taken up research as uh, geoscience research as their career, they will choose so. And as a, as a 
science institute art science institute in this state uh, i'm I, I can tell you this uh, if you are interested let us know we'll try to help you in every manner to uh, pursue your career in geosciences and uh, i have been given to understand that there is already some kind of collaboration with uh, the crash college and i i on behalf of the ministry as well as uh, from my institute i would love to have people from this college coming here learning new techniques learning to do research in geosciences and uh, i'm pretty sure we will have a beneficial uh, interaction and uh, successful coexistence in this state so i once again uh, welcome you all for uh, this uh, colloquium and uh, yeah i will be available uh, if anything comes up in between and you want my help in any manner please let me know and uh, thank you everybody and well, uh, welcome once again i wish uh, all the success for the conference thank you Thank you so much, sir, for your inspiring and enlightening words. Now, let me invite Reverend Father Jacob Nyerinyamuli, Manager, Christ College Autonomous, for the felicitation. Sorry for the inconvenience. Let me now invite Professor Nokudula Winfred Kunain, Dean of Faculty of Science and Agriculture, University of Zululand, South Africa, for the felicitation. I welcome you, sir. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, thank you all for joining this virtual uh, geoscience colloquium. I would like to specially recognize uh, Dr. Father Jolie Andrews, the principal of Christ College, and also Prof. Jacob Nerinjampili, the manager of Christ College, Prof. Jyoti Ranjandre, the director of National Center for Earth Science, the organizers, Dr. Lindo Alapat from Christ College and Prof. Elumalai, Prof. Vetrimulam Alumalai from the University of Zululand. Good afternoon and a warm welcome to all the delegates as you are coming from different countries and that is so commendable. Also, including our colleagues and also the students that are attending in this colloquium. Christ College and the University of Zululand signed an MOU in December 2019 for academic and research collaboration. And with that relationship, these uh, two institutions have also jointly organized this uh, geoscience uh, colloquium. As Dr. and Father Jolie Andrews have mentioned, we are all grateful that our collaboration is yielding the results even though things took a little bit more time than we have planned because of the COVID-19 pandemic. However, with all the troubles that the pandemic has brought to us, it has taught us to be able to connect globally, which would have even been costier under the normal circumstances of the pre-COVID-19 pandemic. I would like to thank Prof. Elumalai from University of Zululand and Dr. Alapat Linto, who have been representatives for the two institutions in the organization of this colloquium. I would also like to acknowledge all the four institutions, which is the Christ College, the University of Kerala, the University of Exeter in UK, and the University of Unizulu, all supported by the Ministry of Earth Sciences in India for having jointly organized this important seven day virtual conference on geoscience. This kind of um, conference enabled us to have various discussions that are very pertinent and that affect the sustainability of the earth at large. I think we all relatively have similar issues that are related to natural resources because of the changes in the environment as well as on the climate. And it seems geoscience play a large role in giving answers for mitigations of these issues. I think we'll get a lot of insight from these uh, discussions. So on behalf of the University of Zululand and the organizing committee, I wish you all the best and success of the program 
and the students also and researchers, I hope you'll benefit from this program. I, I, I thank you all. Thank you so much, ma'am. Now we will have an overview for each session, a very short overview of about four minutes. It will be given by our distinguished delegates. With all due respect, let me now invite Dr. Angela Galega Sala from Geography Department, School of Life and Environmental Science, University of Exeter, UK, to give an overview on our first session, New Proxies of Climate Change of the Past and Present. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you. Um... I would like, first of all, to thank uh, Dr. Linto Alapat for having the great init initial idea of organizing the colloquium and doing such a great job at making it happen. Thank you, Linto, for inviting me to chair the new proxies of climate change of past and present session with you. Um, we are very happy to chair this first session of the colloquium in which a very exciting bunch of talks will be presented, presenting the latest advancements in the reconstruction of past climates using proxy means in different archives in two half days to tomorrow. I would like to extend a special thank to our keynote speaker, Dr. Brian Chase, for giving the inaugural talk for our session that will be the inaugural talk also of the colloquium, as well as to the rest of the invited speakers to this session, Dr. David Nafs, Tom Sim, Rabiul Biswas, Anne Alexandra, Sankonvan Chow Chai, Runa Anthony, Dylan Young, and Nicole Sanderson. Through our invited talks, we will be taken on a fascinating journey spanning diverse biomes of the world, from South Africa to the Arctic, from the Alps to West Africa, Southeast Asia, Antarctica, and Canada but also a journey that will span diverse epochs from the Xenozoic to the near present and into the future with our modeling tool. I hope you will enjoy this journey. Many thanks. Thank you so much, ma'am. Now let me invite Dr. Sajin Kumar Kes, Assistant Professor, University of Kerala, and adjunct assistant professor, Michigan Technological University, USA, to give an overview on our session, Geohazards, Tigation and Management. Over to you, sir. Good afternoon. Thank you so much, uh, Asha Marin Jolly. First of all, uh, uh, I would congratulate Dr. Lindo Alapart for two reasons for providing me an opportunity to organize a session on Geohazards, Mitigation and Management and a big salute for organizing such a colloquium and collating all the geoscientists across the globe in a single platform and that too for a continuous seven days. Uh, it is a great privilege to get part in this program. And saying about my session, of course, everyone knows that studying natural hazards is really a pressing requirement, especially in a state like Kerala. Uh, which experiences uh, what is quite often landslides and floods and seldom by other hazards. And during these hazards, what happens is that several lives were affected as well as properties. So it is high time that we have to bring the science or the scientific information behind these hazards uh, to the common person. So which is the platform which is good for bringing this idea or reaching this idea to the common layman? I think this colloquium is ideal platform to impart awareness uh, so that awareness can be carried to the society. So for this purpose, I tried my level best to pull the best or the efficient geoscientists across the globe to uh, give the awareness on natural hazards. And uh, to name all these members, uh, otherwise it will not be good if I am not naming them. The session will be uh, what is an, uh, started by a keynote address by Dr. Shegar Lukos Kuriakos, who is the member secretary for the Kerala State Disaster Management Authority. Then uh, followed by Professor Brian from NUS College, Singapore, Professor Thomas Uman from Michigan Technological University, Professor Van Westen, which is known to all the people people who study landslides uh, from ITC Netherlands, 
And the second day will be by handed by Dr. Tabas Martha from National Remote Sensing Center, Hyderabad. Then by Dr. Karen from United Nations Environment Program, Ms. Vrindanath from United Nations Development Program, and Mr. Vishnu from Michigan Technological University, United States of America. I hope this session will not only entertain you, but enlighten you with a much and more idea that will be beneficial for the society. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir. Now let me invite Dr. Saju Menacheri, sedimentologist, reservoir quality, geoscience consultant, Geo Reservoir Solution, Perth, Australia, to give session overview on developments in stratigraphy and sedimentology, big data analytics and artificial intelligence in geoscience, geoscience and integrated reservoir engineering. Over to you, sir. Your mic is mute, sir. Sir, please unmute yourself. I think now it's all right. Yes, sir. Okay, that's great. Thank you very much for pointing that. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all the attendees from all over the world. Respected dignitaries are on the inaugural function and everyone present in our International Geoscience Colloquium online conference. Uh, this is a conference which gives you a wide range of subjects with the different, different uh, topics from different people, different speakers from all around the world. So I have to thank first to the entire organizing committee to putting all that together for an international conference online. And a special mention to Linda Alapart for the initiation for this uh, conference. So I'm a, a reservoir quality geologist and I'm taking over the session chair of the session three, which is development stratigraphy and sedimentology, um, which is like, uh, you can see these days are uh, more uh, developments and implications or importance on uh, stratigraphy and sedimentology, which is more applicable to uh, especially oil and gas industries so they are, the talks are more of uh, um, interested for uh, geoscience students who can, or the young professionals who can lead to oil and gas industry. The next one, which is the big data analytics and artificial intelligence in geosciences. You know, the, the time, the present time is more of um, big data analytics. And there are a lot of data sitting in uh, each one of these uh, entire geoscience area. So getting all of that and to make that useful uh, interpretations and to give a, a new insight with all this data. So that's the next future for uh, geosciences to integrate all these uh, big data analysis. So there are uh, very good uh, uh, talks on uh, um, that subject is also, um, uh, you can see in the, in the um, brochure. The next one, geoscience and integrator reservoir modeling. That's also where uh, the present day, the software, there are a lot of coding is happening. That's a lot of uh, software is uh, developing and that's all can be utilized for uh, visualizing the entire uh, geoscience data. So that's also a very good area for uh, new career uh, or uh, new students or young professionals to get into uh, those talks. So on behalf of the organizing committee and myself, welcome you all to the session three of the conference from 27th November, 1st and 2nd of December. In the session three, there are, the talks are so important that which brings a lot of latest developments, uh, which you can see through the uh, a new, more of a integrating different disciplines to the geosciences uh, with uh, uh, present day um, data analytics and artificial intelligence. We got around uh, 12 talks lined up and will be delivered in three days. Um, let me introduce our speakers. On um, 27th of November, we got around uh, five uh, speakers, which comes from um, Saudi Arabia, Mohammed Ali Khalifa. He's talking about the sub subsurface reservoir imaging through characterization of 3D modeling. Then uh, uh, the application of the seismic 
uh, methods to characterize subsurface of the earth by Kevin Jarvis from Australia. Then another talk from Saudi Arabia from Mahmoud with a second stratigraphy. They are more of uh, carbonate ones. That's also very interesting. And uh, myself, I'm talking about uh, significance of sedimentology in site characterization for geological storage of carbon dioxide. Then we had also one more on that same day, it's hydrology and groundwater issues on Alberta. That's a talk from uh, Canada by uh, Lali Anil. Then um, first of December, we got uh, can you Somat Bata from South Africa? He's talking about uh, uh, time series analysis and forecasting using the novel hybrid uh, LSTM data driven model based on empirical wavelet uh, transform applied to total column of ozone uh, from that's uh, from uh, Buenos Aires. Also, another talk on the same day from uh, Hector talking about uh, multi temporal and multi source machine learning approaches to the detection of archaeological sites over large areas. Then on 2nd of December, we got um, uh, machine learning in subsurface analysis, uh, talking um, Johannes Nuora from Indonesia. And the same day, we got another talk from Mohammed Rauman from USA on a solution of real-time completion effectiveness, a data-driven approach to improve field operations, more uh, oil and gas industry. Uh, another talk from uh, geomechanics, application of geomechanics in solving drilling and production related challenges of oil and gas fields by Sakaria John from Australia. And uh, the other very interesting talks comes from uh, Dr. Simon Lang from Australia, Western Australian University on fluvial deltaic analogs and their application to reservoir characterization. Also, Another talk from uh, Stephen Hersiotis on role, role of uh, ecology in the analysis of modern and ancient sedimentary system. So it's all a very interesting talks. And uh, um, again, I'm welcoming you all to participate and to get the insights of all these talks during all that uh, uh, 20, November 27th, December 1st and 2nd. Thank you very much. And thank you for attending this conference. This is highly, highly appreciated. Thank you. Thank you, sir. To extend our gratitude, let me now invite Dr. Vetri Murugan Elumalai, University of Zululand, South Africa, for the vote of thanks. Over to you, sir. Thank Thank you. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Good afternoon, Good afternoon everyone. It's, it's an honor to give you a word of thanks on the occasion of the inaugural session on International Geosciences Colloquium, jointly organized by Christ College. University of Kerala, University of Exeter, UK, and University of Zululand, South Africa, supported by Ministry of Earth Sciences, Government of India. On behalf of the organizing committee and the team, I am very hearty gratitude to all the speakers for sharing their graceful words with us in today's colloquium. The honorable respected guests, Prof. Jolie Andrews, Principal Christ College, Prof. Jacob Jaranjam Pillai, Manager Christ College, Prof. Chodhiranjan Ray, Director of National Air Sciences, Minister of India. Prof. Nakutula Kunayane, Dean of the Faculty of Science and Agriculture, University of Zululand. My colleagues and dear students. It has been our tribute to host all the members and audience of the webinar Geoscience Colloquium. I am thankful to all of you for the participating in the webinar Geoscience Colloquium. I must remark the proficient sense of gratefulness to all of our guests for giving their precious time to participate in the colloquium and sharing with us some of the finest words. All the participants of this colloquium are all inspired by your highly sparkling words. We have been fortunate to have the 
provision as a renowned academicians and the researchers to address the wide areas of geosciences that scientists are engaged in for the benefit of the students, early career, early, early career researchers and the communities. I'm very thankful and like to acknowledge the four host universities as well as sponsors of this colloquium. Thanks to all speakers for giving such a valuable information and speech. I thank our scientific advisory committee, Prof. Singhvi, Vice President of Indian National Science Academy, Prof. Manfred Fenchen, Applied Geophysics Germany, and Prof. Il Prof. Ilongo, Department of Geology, Anna University, India, for their guidance and support at every point of time to organize the, and make this Geoscience Colloquium a grand success. I take this opportunity to thank my colleagues and the entire organizing committee, Dr. Angelo Galigo Sala, University of Exeter, UK, Dr. Lindo Alapat, who Christ College, who is my friend and the person behind this successful event, and Dr. Sajin Kumar, University of Kerala. The local organizing team, Mr. Tarun, Mr. Ponna, Roshini, Koba Kumar, Asha Marin, Jolie, Dr. Devi, Dr. Nadini, Dr. Sabin Jose, Dr. Manju, Dr. Rekha Shema, Iris Aslam, Ayapadas for their support, cooperation, and representing their valuable views. It's not possible to thank everyone of them for such an appreciated involvement and the willingness to have expressed to make this event a great success. A special thanks to Prof. Ntoze, Vice Chancellor of the University of Zululand, for all the support and motivation behind this successful collaboration with Christ College Autonomous. A special gratitude for Prof. Winford Kunene for her representation and participating on behalf of University of Zululand and her tireless support in all means. I'm thankful to Christ College manage, Management, the office staffs, research scholars, and each and every one who have given their immense support, direct or indirect role. My sincere apologies if I have missed any acknowledgement. Thank you so much once again. Thank you, sir. That brings an end to the official inaugural ceremony. Now uh, our official session will begin very shortly. I request everybody to hold on and have a great time. Thank you. Dr. Angela. Hi. Uh, uh, we have, yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, we have got about four minutes to begin. Should we start now or wait for four minutes? I think we wait because if people are joining us to listen at 10, let's, uh, yeah. uh, let's wait until uh, two minutes before. I'll just give a, a, a short overview of how the session will work. Um, sure. That's good. Thank you. Okay. This one, this one. <laughs> some instructions for the participants. Please mute yourself so that we do not get any interruptions between the meeting and also uh, off your video so that we don't get any inconvenience in between. I hope. You can post your questions in the chat box and also in the YouTube. And we will come to the questions at the end of the presentation.
Uh, hello and welcome to the to our first session of the colloquium. Um, our session is new proxies of climate change of the past and the present. Um, as I said, we have a very full and exciting session. We will have five uh, really exciting talks and each of the talks will be between 20 and 30 minutes. And there will be about 10 minutes of questions and answers afterwards. Um, as I don't know the person that is presenting, but as she said, uh, there will be a, a possibility of asking questions. I would like you to pose them on the chat, either on, on Zoom, if you're using Zoom or on YouTube, and I will be uh, making sure that, th that they are answered at the end. Um, there will be a break in between sessions. Uh, don't go away or, or go away, but come back. Um, and uh, you're also, I wanted to say, you're also welcome to raise your hand if you're using Zoom so that I can give you the, the chance to ask the question in person if you would like. Um, and now it's time, so I'm gonna welcome Dr. Brian Chase, who's gonna uh, give a talk on coming of age in a dry place, rock hydrax middens and plus past climate dynamics in South Af Southern Africa. Um, Brian is a director of the Centre uh, National de la Recherche Scientifique and vice president of the International Union for Quaternary Research, INQUA. And we are very happy to have him give the inaugural uh, session on our, um, on our session. Thank you, Brian. Thanks, and Angela. I, I'm very honored. I'd like to thank everybody who's organized this and, uh, and, and for inviting me, of course. Um, I have... Uh, I need to be able to share my screen, which is disabled presently. Um, so as soon as that gets sorted out, I'll start my talk. Um, I, uh, I, I, I realized I didn't have a half hour talk, so I've hacked brutally at a 45 minute talk to make it fit. So we'll see how this all goes. Um, um, if, you, if you go over a little bit, it's okay, because we have a little bit of leeway between uh, sessions. So. Uh, if you want to make it a little bit longer, it's also possible. Okay. Or you can always virtually throw things at me to get me to stop talking. So. Yeah, I, I will do that if necessary. <laughs> Perfect. Okay. I see that I can share now, so I will start that. Uh, is the proper screen up? Does everybody see a slideshow? Yes. It's, okay. Perfect. Okay. So this... Um, this is a talk about work that I've been developing over the last um, maybe 15 years now, come to think of it. Um, and it's going to have sort of three parts. There's, there's the development of a new archive and a new proxy in a place that's very difficult to work. Um, there is um, a bit on the background of why it's so interesting. And then there's just a couple little results to show you what this has given us, how this has taken us forward. and you know, probably where we're going a bit in the future. So um, just very quickly, um, this is the earth for those who are unfamiliar with it. And I thought I'd start generally because the audience seems so diverse, um, but there are very simply, basically four colors that you can see here. There's the blue bit, which is fine and we can forget it and we leave that to the paleo-oceanographers. But on land, there's, there's generally kind of three different types of environments um, to break it down very brutally. And the first um, is the white bit near the tops and the bottoms of this picture. And if you want to know about what's happened there, you put on your big puffy jumper, you get on a tractor, you drive out onto a glacier, and you get a beautiful core like this, which gives you the kind of incredible records that we're familiar with from the, from the polar ice caps. Um, you publish this in Nature, you become famous, you know, the world is your oyster. Um, the green bits, are probably where most of us live and work, really. Um, and those you find around the mid-latitudes, around the equator. And those are also quite conducive to providing us with information about how the environment's changed over long terms. And for this, you get a little tiny raft, you put way too many people on it, you send it out in the lake, or you find some old men, you stick them on a pole, and you get a sediment core. And from these sediment cores, you can look at the fossil pollen, you can look at the diatoms, you can do all sorts of things to create 
again, lovely time series. So on the top here, vegetation change. Um, and on the bottom, let me just get my little pointer here quickly. No, come back. There, I'll use that. Um, here you get nice vegetation change. And on the bottom, you can reconstruct things like lake levels from diatoms. So again, you can get a good idea of what's happened over time in these regions. Um, this leaves us with the brown bits. Um, the brown bits are complicated. Um, they're also everywhere. Um, on obviously the big Sahara brown bit in, in Africa, but you know, that extends obviously over into India. You find it in South Africa, Australia. A significant part of the earth is dry. In fact, too dry to support lakes, um, certainly too warm to have ice caps. Um, and when you look at these landscapes, they aren't promising if you're thinking about where can I go to get the information I need to understand what's happened in the past. Um, for my PhD, I did a lot, a lot of work on dunes like this, trying to date them, figure out when they were formed. Other work has been done on fluvial sediments over here in the bottom right, but it is complicated. Um, and the, the aggregate data sets that we've gotten from this are things like this, where you have a lot of black boxes and white boxes and gray boxes. And you try to say something about it, <laughs> which is complicated to say the least. Um, but, you know, kind of blur your eyes, step back, you look at this and you could maybe say, oh yeah, well, you know, there's a lot of stuff that's been seen as being wet indicators up here in the kind of three to 1000 late Holocene. Late Holocene, probably pretty wet, except when you start to break this down and you look at just a single boxes like this, the hop escarpment, this is a comparison with those data with a longer continuous high resolution record from, from a nearby speleothem. And you can see that really the two ages that define that black box, um, which is literally a black box actually, or metaphoric perhaps, both, um, is that this quote unquote wetter area actually occurred during a drier period and is marked by two really sort of extreme discrete events. Um, so how good is that aggregate data set? To what extent can we really get the sort of spatiotemporal pictures of change that we're looking for? Well, in any case, th this hasn't stopped us. And we've gone, you know, we have uh, core dunes, we've looked at lake shorelines as much as that does not look like a lake shoreline. Um, and we've get these records, these data sets. Um, there's a paleo shoreline data set, which if you're like me, doesn't suggest a whole lot except that there have been lakes in this area over time. That hasn't stopped people from making sort of grand inferences, um, justifiably, you know, you're trying to understand what's going on, you make the most of what you have. Um, and they've identified HS1, the younger Dryas, and kind of eight, eight and a half thousand years as being particularly wet, perhaps. Now, you may see that in that data. I have a harder time with it. Um, Dunes are similar. You, you get these ages, they've got huge errors associated with them, but we try to draw more information from them than possibly we should. And here, you know, they've, they've said, oh, between 15 and four, 11 and eight, 6.4. These are these dry periods. Are they? Are they any drier than the rest of the record? Um, and that these dune records and these shorelines, they fit and see they're telling the same story. It's not what you'd call satisfying. And this is particularly unsatisfying because actually this region is maybe, if I dare say it, uniquely informative. The potential to understand long-term climate change in these brown areas is particularly potent. And it is because they are at the interface of, of a wide range of systems. And they can tell you a little bit about each of those systems rather than any single one. Um, in Southern Africa, which is gonna be kind of the topic of a lot of what I'm looking at here, the three primary systems, again, kind of breaking this down to simple terms. The first are these big kind of purple blue bit, these, this westerly storm track. And you get this in the Northern hemisphere as well. And it brings these big frontal systems in the winter. Um, and over longer periods in, in Southern Africa, this has been linked to changes in Antarctic sea ice, where the Antarctic sea ice presses north during colder periods, shifts the storm tracks north, and brings more frontal rain to the Cape in southwestern Africa. Um, the other one, the kind of obvious one for Africa, if you look at it from, from the broad scale, is the African rain belt, this big green area in the center here. 
sometimes uh, related with the ITCZ, although that's only a marine phenomenon, really. Um, but it, it, it follows that same seasonal pattern of wherever, uh, it sort of follows the summer months, let's say, and it brings convective rainfall through terrestrial heating and evaporation off these warm oceans. Um, and that is not operating in isolation. It's restricted to extent by these high pressure systems that you get off the Sort of Northwest Africa here, certainly Southwest Africa. And these impede the extent to which these moisture bearing systems related to tropical flow can extend into the continent and, and drive environmental change. So it's highly dynamic. Um, and in Southern Africa, it's created um, extreme seasonality. We're down here, this purple bit in the Southwestern Cape is what we call the winter rainfall zone. Most of the rain that comes there these winter frontal systems, um, very little summer rain. Conversely, all this red and orange bit, this is pr primarily tropical rain. A lot of it comes from the Indian Ocean, some of it's evicted off the Atlantic Ocean further north towards the equator, but all of this is mostly summer rain. Very little rain falls in the winter months. Um, this seasonality um, being linked to these broader circulation systems um, has shifted over time. The winter rainfall zone during glacial periods, for instance, is thought to have extended further north as the Atlantic, Antarctic sea ice extends north, westerly storm tracks come into closer contact with, with the subcontinent, more influence, more winter rain across more of the area is the idea. How do we test that? How can we look for information to, to, to indicate what has gone on in the past? Um, Actually, some of the first people to really break into the field that I'm gonna describe for you here, which is looking at um, fossilized herbivore middens, which you'll have a much clearer idea about in a second, were um, two French guys, um, Armand Pons and Pierre Cazel. And they, in, 19, in the 50s, um, they went to the Sahara, to the Hogar Massif, and they looked at the deposits left by um, the excreta of this little animal, which is a Procavia species. It's a, it's a rock hyrax, which is the subject of the talk. But the problem was that they are French, um, that they wrote in French, and that this really just didn't get picked up in the way that I think it probably should have, because they're in an area where there's virtually no information, and they're getting reliable, interesting paleoenvironmental information from these, from these uh, deposits. Um, the whole field, it didn't really kick off until the Americans started to look at it. I'm not biased. Well, I might be biased, but I'm, I'm not in this sense. Um, they started to look at these massive piles of fossilized urine and fecal pellets that this little guy, the, pa the, um, the pack rat, creates. And these are nests. They build them with sticks and they uh, pee on them, essentially. They wet their beds. And this encases, you can see this black fossilized urine encasing these pine needles. When dated, these pine needles, which can be identified to species level, um, turned out to be 13,000 years old, sometimes 40,000 years old. They spanned a lot of the last, um, termination certainly, but extending into the last glacial period substantially as well. And from this, they were able to reconstruct really quite nice detailed pictures of how the vegetation changed over time in these areas. Um, Louis Scott, um, a friend of mine and uh, the, the pioneer in this field, um, a South African fellow from Bloemfontein, he happened to be doing a postdoc over in the lab in Arizona where these guys were working on their pack rat middens. He saw this stuff and was like, oh, you know, it's, it's funny. I've seen things like this in South Africa. Um, and he started asking some questions and looking into it a little bit. And he was started to think about his own hyraxes. These are the animals in South Africa that I've created that giant blob that was looming over Louis in the last picture. Um, and what's great about these animals is they're everywhere. They are, I mean, I could go into the ecology for quite a long time. They are phenomenal survivors. Um, they live in such a diverse range of environments that actually the climate can change, but they don't have to leave because they can endure. Um, they live in some of the driest parts of South Africa, Southern Africa, and you find them in places where there's less than 100 millimeters of rain every year. Um, where they live, they 
obviously have to do their business, but they have this particular habit of kind of tending to do it in the same place all the time. Um, and these latrines become accumulations of urine and, and fecal pellets. Um, so Louis started thinking about this and he, he kind of saw them with new eyes after he had, he had met with these Americans. And he went back and as you do, he grabbed his ladder, went out to a nearby cliff and with his garden saw started hacking at these deposits. Um, and somehow managed to get <laughs> usable chunks out of them because these are hard as rock. They are, it's like amber, um, they call it uh, clip sweat, um, rock sweat. And it's, it's not an inappropriate name because the this, this stuff is bulletproof. So what he ended up doing was getting lots of little pieces of these middens and putting them all together and creating this aggregate record from it. Um, another problem was that he, at the time he was doing this was already quite a, an old and solid fellow. Um, and a lot of these are only found way up on cliffs. Um, so th this is where I kind of came into it because I used to do a lot of rock climbing and I'd been working on sand dunes, saw that wasn't going anywhere really. And I thought, aha, I'm the guy for this job. I can do this. So I went at it with my, my bandana and my hatchet and ended up breaking the hatchet and the saw and about 17 other things. Um, came back with my lab coat, which always helps when you're doing science, um, and an angle grinder and a very long extension cord, and managed to get some interesting material. Now, over the years, we've evolved. We jump off higher cliffs. We use different equipment. We're better protected <laughs> from inhaling this vile dust. Um, and now what we can do is, with a bit of hard work, and if you're not afraid of getting dirty, we can turn massive middens like this one here on the left into lovely continuous sequences. And these sequences extend over thousands of years. Um, and most importantly, they aren't nests like this. It's an American Australian in this South American actually, where it's built by the animal and then peed on. These are actual uh, <laughs> laminated deposits of fossilized urine is what we, what we really look for. And this section here, it looks like a lot like a speleothem, if you know what those are, um, you know, highly laminated, highly resolved. And this is only two centimeters. Um, some of these middens are two meters thick. So we have incredibly long, incredibly well uh, detailed sequences of a wide range of proxies. We're not looking at just stable isotopes or anything like this. Each of these samples contains pollen, phytolus, microcharcoal, stable isotopes, biomarkers, ancient DNA. Um, so from any single sample, you can get all this information. And that's really quite unique, um, certainly in dryland areas, but really globally. Um, so just to look at a couple little things here to see what we're getting. So this is a site from Derif, way down in the Southwestern Cape in the Feinbos biome. Um, and we had a, a look at this and we, we looked at the pollen, time consuming, this bulk uh, nitrogen and carbon stable isotopes, um, which is much easier to do. You just drill lots of little tiny holes, send it off to a lab, get the results, and boom, you have lovely curves like this. And this is the last termination, termination one. Um, and you can see if you're familiar with it, some familiar patterns perhaps, but this is a very small change in carbon and nitrogen is something which is very rarely used. Um, for the carbon, generally what people take it to mean is a change in photosynthetic pathway. So going from C3 uh, trees and grasses to C4 warm season, sorry, trees and shrubs to C4 warm season grasses. Now in, at the rift, those grasses are actually C3 because it's winter rainfall, so it's cool growing season. Um, so we're actually looking at a different aspect of what carbon can tell us. Um, and that is water use efficiencies, leaf level changes that are quite coherent and um, they, they correlate strongly with changes in plant available water, water availability. So with more water, you have lower delta 13C values. Um, similarly with the delta 15N, um, there's a lot of noise here obviously, but these are modern samples. So that's kind of to be expected. It's highly variable in the landscape, um, but again, we're looking at just this dry area. You have a slightly uh, more reactive, responsive um, relationship between here, aridity index, so wetter over on the right here and drier over on the left. And you have higher delta 15N values when it's drier. And this is coherent even looking at modern ecosystems, but it really pops up when you're looking at, um, at the midden records because those 
uh, average, um, you know, decades, several decades, and a larger landscape. So you're not looking at a single plant, taking it a, a, a local average. Um, so we can kind of put some headings on here and we can say increased moisture availability and decreased moisture availability. And you can see that it's sort of a drier period here, 19 to seven, getting wetter, getting drier. Okay, well, I was a paleoclimatologist or anybody looking at this, it's like, the question is why? Why did this happen like this when, when it happened? Um, so looking regionally, you know, from this marine core in the Benguela system, we see that there's a really good relationship between sea surface temperatures and humidity at the uh, With warmer sea surface temperatures, you have wetter conditions. And conversely, colder and drier. Um, the expectation at this latitude in the southern hemisphere is that you're going to have a pretty clear Antarctic cold reversal signal, which is um, not really what we're getting. We don't have the sort of classic dome sea Antarctic southern hemisphere pattern. We have something which actually has anomalies which fit much better with the northern hemisphere. And this is the younger dryas as defined by the Engrip uh, ice cores. Um, this is again because you have changes in Antarctic, uh, sorry, Antarctic Atlantic meridional overturning circulation, uh, the Gulf Stream in, in, in the North Atlantic. And what this does is it pulls the warmth out of the southern hemisphere right into the North Atlantic and warms up the North Atlantic. But when you freshen the North Atlantic, it blocks the, this current and all this heat stays in, in the southern hemisphere. Similarly, related rainfall stays in the southern hemisphere. You have wetter conditions when you have warmer um, Southeast Atlantic sea surface temperatures. Looking at this over the last 20,000 years, there's been an evolution we see in the relationship where this is consistent, where during Heinrich Stadia 1, you shut down the overturning circulation, shut down AMOC, and you get this slow increase in heat and humidity across the period. Um, other freshening events during the Younger Dryas in 8.2, that hasn't worked like that. And what we've inferred from this is that there was so much ice related to the HS1 events that that um, shutting down AMOC and keeping that heat in the Southern Hemisphere. Whereas the lesser freshening of the Younger Dryas in 8.2 did not manifest in the same way. So what we're pulling out is some really pretty fine scale dynamics and relationships that are helping us understand local change in a global context. Um, so a couple of basic questions. Are coolers- Brian, can I, can I just stop you? Sorry. Can <laughs> Hukma Ram please mute your phone, your microphone? There is some uh, problem. Thank you. It's cool. Thank you very much. Sorry, Brian. No, 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 not at all. It's, it's the beauty of Zoom calls. Um, so a basic question again, you know, so are cooler glacial periods wetter in Southern Africa's winter rainfall zone? Um, to, to look at this, we actually moved away from the Benguela region because there's complicating factors associated with upwelling. And it, it's a cool story, but I don't have time for it here. Um, so we're looking here at, at Southern Export, which is away from the Benguela, but still, strongly impacted by this uh, shift in, in the westerlies in the sea ice. So the idea is that, you know, modern winter sea ice during the LGM, it extends up this way. The subtropical front, which is kind of the rails along which the westerly storm track ride, also gets pushed north. And so we, sh should, sh we, not, we should see this influence at sub of Eaksport. And we do. Um, this is just the Holocene. It's something published in 2013. And you can see that increased moisture availability fits with reduced mean annual temperature. I've inverted this axis just to highlight the, the, the positive, or the, sorry, the strength of the relationship and make it a bit more evident. Um, and you can see that during cooler periods, you have wetter climates. Um, this could be down to a reduced potential evapotranspiration for sure. Um, but we also see that it is linked with other records from elsewhere that are not they aren't associated with climate in the same way. And this is a, a, um, an iron count record from a Marine Corps off, off of Chile, which has been interpreted in terms of westerly, the position of the westerlies. And for over this time period, you can see that again, you know, at, at Civic Eastport, there's increased moisture variability when this Chilean site is showing changes in, in the position of the westerlies. Um, 
looking at another proxy, you have uh, Antarctic sea ice extent um, here, looking at the sea salt sodium flux. Um, so how much sea ice is built, how much, uh, how many ice, uh, salty ice crystals essentially are there to be deflated and blown into the ice core. And you can see again, there's a really nice relationship here between increased moisture availability and increased sea ice extent. Um, going back 25,000 years, at the first order, that is the major broad change, regardless of little millennial scale availability, this relationship also holds. So we perceive this to be, we infer this to be, again, the primary driver of long-term change at this time scale. This is supported by another record from Popscales Fontaine, which is just a bit over from Sovixport. And there we have a 70,000 year record of fossilized urine, if I can remind you, um, that shows really coherent patterns of change, again, with wetter conditions with increased sea ice. Um, so what we can say is that cooler conditions generally relate to increased humidity in the winter rainfall zone, not all of it, um, and that the Holocene is drier than the LGM, and that there's probably a mechanistic link between the position of the subtropical front, Antarctic sea ice, and uh, humidity in, in the southwestern Cape. Um, conversely, can we say that warmer interglacial periods are wetter in Southern Africa's summer rainfall zone? So with increased evaporation, increased convection, does it get wetter? Um, generally, the answer would be yes. Yes, it does. Um, some reconstructions that we've done from the Northern summer rainfall zone show a pretty clear relationship between uh, temperature and precipitation. And as temperature declines, precipitation decreases. And as it increases, it increases. Um, but this is from the green bit of the summer rainfall zone. And again, we're looking at brown things. So what we wanted to find was, well, what's going on in, in Namibia, which is a long standing question. Um, so we went to some sites, this one at Pella, and you can see it's dry. <laughs> it's very, very dry. Uh, it's probably about 130 millimeters grain a year, I think. Um, and we've got a nice 50,000 year long record from some middens that we've collected there. We combine that with, um, I say we combine that, we also looked at a site named Zizu, um, founded in 2006 after Zizu's famous headbutt in the World Cup. This is the Namib sand sea off in the distance. So it's really right on the edge of, of, of a hyper arid region. Um, and then there's Spitzkop, which is kind of my favorite site because it's probably the most beautiful place I've been in Southern Africa. Um, and we have a very highly resolved 35,000 year record from there. Um, what we noticed is that e there's a lot of variability in all these records because it's very dry, interannual change, um, variability is high. So that's expected, but is there, is there a strong signal in this, not even noise, I'm not gonna call it that, does it a disservice, but can we see something bigger over the longer front time frames? So what we've done, or what I did in a 2019 paper in, in geology, was we put all these together um, and we created uh, a composite record, which maybe shouldn't be looked at quite so much for the noise and the detail, but for the longer scale trends. And that's what I'm gonna talk about just very quickly here. Um, you can see that there is increased moisture availability. All these little blue cylinders are random little peat, fossilized peat deposits or uh, carbonate uh, reed beds or things like that. Um, that people have looked at before dated and said, look, it's got to be wetter when this was forming. These blue bars are when those carbonate reed beds, uh, when the peat deposits were, were forming. And it fits quite well with what we're seeing here. So those little super low resolution records I showed you in the beginning, they aren't ridiculous, um, but they're obviously a lot less informative than what we're getting from the higher accidents. Um, what it's showing also is, is what's quite interesting because this is a marine core that has been used to say, look, precession drives everything. Um, we've got a really strong relationship between uh, high summer insulation and humid and wet conditions. Um, but what we're getting from the Hyraxmans is not at all of this. Um, the red is that same insulation curve and the yellow again is the Hyraxmans. And you can see that actually drier conditions correspond with high insulation and wetter conditions can correspond with low insulation. So how do we, how do we compare these? How do we say, okay, well, this Marine Corps is, what, what does the Marine Corps mean? 
Um, we have these three records from the NAMIB. They're all saying pretty much the same thing, and it's not what we're seeing in the Marine Corps. Um, what we've found is, what we imagine is that the Marine Corps is actually um, reflecting material that's transported from really quite far away. Um, this is the land sea pressure gradient. So 9,000 years ago, 10,000 years ago, the gradient was low. And in both directions, either moving towards the present or moving towards the LGM, that gradient increases. Here you can see low pressure over the continent during the LGM and very high pressure over the Southeast Atlantic. What this does it, is it essentially draws air across the Namib, cold, dry air from the Menguela across the Namib and into Southeastern Africa. This means that there's actually this dipole between the Southwest and the Southeast um, driven by these, by these pressure gradients. So looking at it, what seems inconsistent at first actually mechanistically makes sense, but you need the records to, to be able to get that, to, to not paint with such a broad brush, to be able to look at things with the detail that they demand to understand them. Um, and this dipole, just quickly, I see I've got just a couple minutes left, but um, again, here's the summer rainfall, the Western summer rainfall in red here, and here's smoothed out NAMIB records. And you can see that indeed the relationship is pretty much anti-phase. When you have a wetter period in the NAMIB, you have generally drier conditions in, in, the, in the Southeast, most notably just around the LGM, just after the LGM, um, uh, right in here in, in, in HS1. So this is interesting because this presents us with a whole new set of questions and a whole new way of looking at everything that happened in the interior. And this is just at orbital time scales. Um, looking at highly resolved records for this is just the last 7,000 years, taking uh, an individual Spitzkopf record with another midden from Maracabi. And you can see that from you know, the early Holocene, um, mid Holocene, they're really quite in phase. But on what appears to be from these data, the third Sunday in Lent, it just changed um, and it went out of phase. Now, presumably this is down to some subtle shifts in this pressure gradient that we've, that we've found, but it remains to be resolved. Um, so key takeaway from this is that the summer rainfall zone is not a homogeneous unit. East and West are often out of phase. And that while there is evidence for processional forcing, it's, it's anti-phase to what you would predict from a direct model. And really it's reflecting more what's happening uh, at higher Northern latitudes. Um, and, uh, and yeah, the whole thing about the pressure gradients. So conclusions, I'm amazed. There's like eight seconds left and I'm just nailing this 30 minutes. How did I do this? Um, so the conclusions are basically, the earth is a complicated place. Um, there is, sorry, let me just turn that off. Um, the earth is a complicated place. Um, there is a lot going on. And what I've certainly found in my career <laughs> as it's gone so far is that the more I know, the more I find, the more I realize I have no idea really what's going on. And each new piece of evidence sort of demands further reflection and completely new unpacking of what I thought I'd created as my, as my framework. And this is great, this is great because one, it keeps you interested. Um, and it, it keeps everything kind of real. Um, you know, you can't you can't go into you can't fall into complacency when you're looking at these kind of records. Um, we've made progress. This is what we had before, which I showed you, vague at best, completely incorrect, probably. Um, and that's that's an important step. And I feel like <laughs> at least we're going in the right direction. So I'd finish there. Uh, and I just want to thank um, again all the organizers for inviting me, and also my my colleagues Sofak Lim, Manish Chevalier, Andy Carr, and Anna Boom in particular at Leicester, who helped me with all this work and clearly carried the beers into the field when we uh, when we quest for. So, thank you. Well, I'm gonna clap on my own. I think. <laughs> <laughs> <Thank> <laughs> <Ryan>. <laughs> That was a brilliant, brilliant presentation. Super entertaining, super interesting. I'm glad you liked, um, it. You liked it. Uh we haven't got any questions posted yet. Uh Linto maybe can say if there is anything. I've been keeping an eye on the on the YouTube link and, you. and there is uh no questions there either. But I'm gonna ask you a question, Brian. Oh sorry, Linto, go ahead. 
Yeah, yes, Angela, there is no questions yet. Uh, probably okay. you can start the, you can be the one. I, I can start then. I have, a, <laughs> I have all the time with Brian. <laughs> Fantastic. There we go. Brian, I'm really, I'm really fascinated. I had no idea. I mean, I love it that it's pee and poo that you're <laughs> looking at. Fantastic. Um, yeah. I, I just wonder, you know, I, I work on peat lens. I just wonder, you know, they, they seem to be such nice records. Do you have problems with, um, you know, gaps in the record or uh, reversals of ages? You know, we have that sort of thing in peat lens all the time. Do you have the same problems? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There, there, sometimes there are gaps. There certainly changes in accumulation rate. But uh, actually, I, 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 I paused. Let me show you. I did have another slide up that kind of speaks. And this is, this is old um, because we've actually got a lot more information than this now. Um, so these are just these I could, one of the first tests because what I was told of um, Stuart Pearson from Australia, we had a bet. He still owes me a case of beer um, that these weren't continuous. He looks at at nests and he said no that's not continuous you're just going to date them and it's all going to come out to be the same and it's just you know yeah sure you can use it but you know you've got your hopes way too high so one of my first things just so i could get a case of beer was to test this um and this is two sides of the derif midden and it is old data i think this was from 2010 we got this but you can see that even though the Oops, sorry, that should be depth in millimeters, not depth in centimeters. Um, that even though the, the depth is different because the, the shape of the midden was such that less material was being deposited on one side than the other, um, accumulation rates were higher. But when you sort out the actual data, when you compare the age depth curves, they actually fit really well. And predictably, when you have more pellets in them, because obviously that's one event, um, and they're about a centimeter uh, across rather than um, a millimeter being 50 years in, in, the, in, the, in the urine, you can see that accumulation rates shoot right up. But now to answer your question, of the, I think uh, 578 radiocarbon ages we've gotten from middens now, I have had one reversal, one that was not in sequence stratigraphically. Um, and even those are explainable, uh, even, or rather even that's explainable because it was at the bottom of the midden. So we were, it was just perfect, 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 perfect. And then this one was not okay. Um, but it was also quite eroded. So groundwater had subsequently flowed along the base of the shelter and brought in new material and new carbon. So it was anomalously young. But this stuff, I mean, and it's kind of shown by the ancient DNA, you don't, that doesn't preserve well, generally. You know, pollen, fantastic, phytolist, all that stuff preserves well. DNA doesn't. And we have incredible preservation of ancient DNA because this stuff, it's like amber. It's, once it's laid down and there's another layer on top of it, it is hermetic it is sealed and nothing touches it again. Um, and unlike all the old carbon reservoir effects you get in lakes and some of these areas, all the material that goes into this goes through the animal. And as it goes through the animal, through the respiration of that animal, it essentially washes the carbon, brings it into equilibrium with the modern atmosphere and then encases it. So it polishes everything up, puts it away, and we find it later. <laughs> I believe it's like the dream uh, deposit. <laughs> it, it no, I mean honestly, I you know again, it's been fifteen years, but I, for me, there's nothing as good as these. I mean, speleothems are cool, sure, but you know, you you get you know oxygen and carbon, and then maybe some rare elements, growth rate, but this, I mean. We haven't even begun to touch what you can do Amazing. from this. It's really, really exciting. Really exciting. Mm -hmm. I love it. I have more questions, but since I think that there is a question now in the chat, I'm going to let somebody else ask your question, <laughs> Brent. Um, okay. So uh, I think it's from... How Carter. far back in time? Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, so it depends. Um, the oldest one we have is actually one I, one I showed. Um, 
obviously you, you can you can date them back to the range of radiocarbon. Um, we have thought about trying to date the mineralogenic sediment in there as well um, to you know get OSL ages. I've sent off stuff for uranium uh, thorium dating, U series dating, and I've kind of it's all in the works, but. I don't think it has much potential. There's very little uranium in these environments for the most part. Um, maybe we'd get lucky ones. Um, but yeah, the oldest one we have, incredible age control up to 50,000 and then obviously goes away. But through comparison, um, we see a very strong relationship with sea ice for instance, and that continues. And if we take the trend indicated by the ages we do have and just shoot that accumulation rate back into time, um, the relationship means, stays coherent. So I think probably about 70,000 years. Um, one question that we've been posing is why not more? Um, and I think what it more or less will come down to is there's probably, there are probably some older ones out there, but you know, the longer you go through time, the more variability you have in the environment and the climate. And these things, if you pour water on them, they go away. Like I, you can't store these in England even, for example, because just the ambient moisture will just turn them into sawdust and they'll fall apart. Um, they're very sensitive. So if the shelter's right, if they're protected well, if there's not, if the population's not too much, because lots of times there's just so many animals, um, if it, the environment's good, that they fill up the, 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 the shelter. And lots of times we find this beautiful midden and about an animal's width of space on top of it, because that is just, <laughs> it can't go in anymore to pee anymore there. Um, so I, I do a service. I, I'm kind of like cleaning the septic tank for them. I go in, I remove these middens so they can go back and start using the shelter again. <laughs> um, I, from that, from what you were saying, why do they always go back to the same? So these are different populations, I guess, you know, over 50,000 years, they're going back to the same place to pee. It's, it's, um, it's odd. I admit. <laughs> I mean, I think there's there's probably two things. I, I've some. I used to think that it was just they'd go everywhere and and pee and poo, um, because you do find you know pellets out and about, and you do find little pools of urine during the dry season about. Um, and that it was just when it was not protected, it got washed away, and so these were just protected environments, and they like the protected environments because they essentially have no natural defenses. And they are probably, a, they are actually a very important uh, calorie source for things like leopards and eagles. And so they hide. What they can do well in terms of uh, protection is they can evade things and whoosh, hide in these shelters. And so I think a lot of times the best latrines are where the sentries are because they've also, they communicate, um, they have language, in, including different dialects. There's a paper from Israel that shows that they actually speak in different languages. Um, but there'll be a sentry and he'll be perched on top of this rock and he'll be looking. And if he sees an eagle, he starts to bark. And the whole colony hides. Or when I start to come with my big power tools, he barks and they all go and hide. Um, so. <laughs> <laughs> it's just uh, more and more fascinating the more we hear i think we could talk to you all <laughs> i could talk to you all morning anyway um, when confinement's very... over we'll have to do that <laughs> yes um i wanted to ask you about your record that uh because i don't think there is any other question linto i can you see any other question i don't see in, uh, no I, in youtube either i don't think uh, I, there was I one from like YouTube, I guess. May I? Oh. I don't know if it's not directly related to this. Uh, it is like, what is the striking difference between high density turbidity current and hypersynical flow? Sorry, I missed that. Yeah. Uh, you... Maybe is it I post... somewhere? Uh, I'll just post it here to everyone. It might just be. Uh, My ears aren't what they used to be. I, I'm not sure whether it's completely related to it, but if you see. 
it, it sounded, I, I didn't quite hear the question, but it sounds like it might not be related to what I'm talking about. You, uh, you may try, I mean, you may ignore it, no problem. It's all right. Okay, perfect. <laughs> I'm happy to answer it, but um, I, I don't. I don't think it related directly to what I was talking about, yeah, or yeah, even yeah. perhaps peripherally. They can send it to me in an email if they want. <laughs> right. Thank you. Um, I just. Uh, I'm interested in your record that shows um, that that there is some uh, agreement with the movement of the westerly winds in the in the Southern Ocean. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm actually working in the Southern Ocean myself and, and I, I was just interested, you know, to, to hear a little bit more about that part. Um, I don't know if you want to say anything else or maybe I can talk to you another time. I mean, we, we have a little bit of time still. Well, I, no, I, I can certainly, I can, it, it's, um, when, I, when I started working in, in Southern Africa and I didn't go into it too, too much here, um, is that there's a, a very, basic paradigm which exists um, for interpreting essentially all records. And that is during glacial periods, the westerly shift north, there's more winter rainfall. And at the same time, it's cooler. So there's less evaporation uh, in tropical regions. There's less convective potential. And so summer rainfall is reduced. So glacial, dry summer rainfall zone, wet winter rainfall zone. And then vice versa, during an interglacial period, it's just inverted where the westerly shifts south and you get less influence. Um, one of the Derif record that I showed first, our expectation was quite different from what we saw because you know it's heart of the winter rainfall zone. It gets, gets some summer rainfall zone, some summer rain now, but very little. And we were thinking, ah, this is gonna be, mwah, this is gonna be the westerly record. This is gonna be the keystone record. Sort of still thinking in, in that mindset of like, this record uh, is somehow enough, like somehow this indicates the whole of the region. Um, <laughs> what we found was, was not that simple. Um, we have another site that I didn't show you, which is just, Jesus, how far is it? It's 50 kilometers to the Northeast. Um, and Derif is in the mountains, right in the, in the top uh, of the range in a, in a valley. And then down in the rain shadow, there's this other site which is actually the pictures that I showed you of Louis Scott at the beginning. Um, and we thought, oh, well, these will be the same, won't they? Because they're only 50 kilometers apart. No, they are opposite. Um, <laughs> they showed there, there's a major event around 7,000 where Derif just dries out. It loses essentially half of its rain in the span of about, I don't know, 100 years tops. And it remains dry after that for a long time. So significant, no matter what you're thinking about. At the same time, this site on the Eastern side in the rain shadow whoop, gets wetter. And we published something on it in uh, a journal, either PPP or QSR last year, I forget which one. Um, and it, it, it highlights this, what we characterize as an extreme hydroclimatic response gradient that when you look at it, there is a gen there, you can link the patterns of change with broader mechanisms like sh shifts in the westerlies. But the manifestation of that phenomenon is really different. <laughs> um, and it looks like what's happening at Derif is you actually need summer rainfall. And a bit of summer rainfall, and you know, imagine a bit of rainfall in the dry months, maybe not even much at all that has a huge impact on global water availability and aridity. You essentially, you take a drought season that's now eight months long and you maybe reduce it to, to two months. You know, think about what that does in terms of aridity, in terms of the vegetation, in terms of so many things. Um, and conversely, what the east side really needs, it doesn't care so much about summer rain because it, it doesn't get any, but these big frontal systems, the big, big winter rainfall systems. Those are what bring it rainfall. So it was a real trick to work out the spatiotemporal dynamics of what these shifts in the westerlies mean. And we pretty much, we only have a good idea for the Holocene because that's when our best resolved records are. 
but we've got a few that we haven't published yet that extend back, you know, 30, 40,000 years. So what we've found is that using um, an interpretive box like shifts in the westerlies, that there's, there's utility in it. You, it's, it is not um, insane or unreasonable, but that what it actually is going to mean in an area at a site can be highly variable. Um, and so we're, right now we're doing now, I'm working with a guy, um, uh, Stuart Browning in uh, Macquarie in, in Australia and trying to create a fingerprint for all of our Southern African sites and compare that with uh, GCMs and the simulations for, you know, like the transit simulations for the past 21,000 years and try to find what synaptic setups best explain what we're seeing in our aggregate data set rather than just a single site. So. Amazing. That's, uh, I think, uh, a good point to end uh, uh, on. I think that's true for a lot of the records that we use, you know, that we use one because it's so hard to get them so much work. But in fact, we need more than one, right, to, to actually yeah, I mean, I, I, it's, it's certainly what I found. And again, you know, the, the last quote that I put, you know, the more I know, the less I know, essentially, um, <laughs> is a lot of times, yeah, you, you know, you, you spend so much time on this record and you think, you need to sell it and it's the be all end all and you're gonna make the absolute most of it. But I am very cautious now, sort of whenever I put out everything, I've got about 10 data sets behind it that I know I'm probably not gonna contradict myself in the future. Yeah. But even with that, I, I do, okay. but that's fine because that's learning. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's what we're here for. Thank you so much, Brian. Really, really uh, enjoyable. Thank, thank you. you. I might send you an email afterwards. Do. Um, I'd love to chat more. <laughs> and and if anybody, anybody, if anybody has any questions they didn't want to ask now, send me an email. I'll flag them and uh, yeah, Thank be you. happy to answer them. Thank you, Brian. Okay. Thank you very much. Hi, guys. Um, so now, actually, Linda is probably there going. Angela is our next talk now. <laughs> so um, I'm going to invite uh, our next speaker. Uh, we're very lucky to have Dr. David Nafs um, from um, the School of Chemistry at the University of Bristol. He's a lecturer and Royal Society Tata Unity Research Fellow there. And he's going to talk to us about biomarkers to reconstruct terrestrial climate and biogeochemistry during the Cenozoic. So with that, I will leave you with David. And can uh, we make sure that he can actually share his screen? Let, let me give it a, a try. Yeah, it should be possible now. Okay. Uh, so I hope. Can you see the presentation? Yes, yes. Yes. Okay. Okay, here we go. Um, First of all, thank you very much uh, for Angela and the other organizers for providing me with the opportunity um, to present to you some of the work we are currently doing in Bristol. Um, so as Angela said, my name is uh, David Nas. I'm um, a Royal Society and Tata uh, University Research Fellow at the University of Bristol, um, affiliated with both the School of Chemistry and Earth Sciences, but I spend most of my time um, in, in chemistry. Uh, let me see, here we go. Um, so what I want to talk to you about today is the work we are doing. Uh, and want to demonstrate to you how we can use molecular fossils, and I will explain what a molecular fossil is in, in, in a little bit, use molecular fossils to inform us actually how terrestrial climate and biogeochemistry has changed over the last 65 million years. I'll focus a bit on Holocene, but also on deep time, uh, some greenhouse periods. Um, for example, I will show some data uh, we generated a few years ago now about actually how uh, temperatures varied in India uh, during uh, the early Paleogene around 50 million years ago. So the main aim is here to give you some idea of like, what is the power of biomarkers? Uh, how can we use them to reconstruct terrestrial climate and biogeochemistry? Let me see if it's working. I have to click. I have to click. Um, but before we dive into, into the data and the methods and everything, I just want to take a step back and actually think about why this is important. Um, so this is a figure from the latest IPCC report uh, that highlights all the different parts of the climate system where in the present day, we know things are changing. 
So think, for example, about sea ice area. We know based on satellite data that sea ice um, area has been declining uh, quite significantly over the last few decades. We know the composition of the air, including CO2 and methane, has changed uh, over time. And we have records for most of these, um, these parts of the climate system for maybe 50, maybe 100, maybe for temperature. Uh, we have 150 years. But beyond that, we actually have a pretty poor understanding of how the climate system operates. So if we go into the paleo, so if we go beyond the instrumental record, we go further back, and it can even be a few thousand years uh, back in time, um, our image looks actually very different from this, it actually looks quite fuzzy and unclear, right? We can sort of see the shapes, we sort of know a little bit what's happening, uh, but a lot of the details are not clear. Over the last 40, maybe 50 years, a lot of work has gone into uh, some specific aspects. Uh, for example, focusing on marine temperatures, we have a pretty good idea about how temperature in the ocean has changed. Um, at least for where we have the ice core records from the Antarctic, we also know relatively well how the composition of the air has changed, at least for, let's say, the, the last one million years. Um, but what we don't know a lot about is actually how things have changed on land. So that is what my research is focusing, is on focusing on trying to understand how things on land have changed, focusing predominantly on temperature on land, but also on biogeochemistry. And I will talk about both of those uh, today. And just to give you an example of what I'm talking about, like how little do we actually know about temperature? So this is uh, a figure from a nature publication from, from a few years ago um, that focuses on reconstructing temperature across the last deglaciation. So the last, roughly 20,000 years, right? So probably the last glaciation is our best understood climatic event, right? We have lots of records from all over the world that, that, that span with radiocarbon dating for chronology. The last deglaciation is probably the, the best studied climatic event we've had and a major event, right? And what you see here, you see uh, the location of all the records they use for this. And it looks like they have a pretty global span, right? They don't have the, the, the polar oceans. But besides that, they span most of the globe, right? So it looks pretty good. Um, but if I then take the same figure, but I remove all the marine records, so all the records from land, what we end up um, is with this graph or this map. And actually what you see is there's almost no data from land. So even from the best studied climatic event, the last deglaciation, we have extremely little information from land. We have some ice cores, we have some data from Alaska, but for example, we have not a single record from um, South America, nothing from Europe, nothing from Australia, and one or two from Asia and Africa, right? So we have a very poor understanding about how terrestrial temperatures change. And this is for one of the best studied events, right? Um, and then you might be like, well, David, I mean, who cares about temperature, right? I mean, I don't really care about temperature. Um, I care about other things in the climate system, but actually temperature is a master control on a lot of different variables. Think, for example, about the terrestrial biosphere, that's governed by temperature. Key by geochemical cycles, and I will come back to this, are governed by temperature. For example, here on the left-hand side, it shows the relation of uh, the flux of methane, uh, logarithmic versus temperature, and you see this linear correlation. So if you see if temperature increases from 20 to 30 degrees, you can see the flux of uh, methane out of, for example, wetland increases fivefold, right? So temperature is a key control on uh, some pretty key by geochemical cycles. For example, the methane cycle, I remember methane is a very potent greenhouse gas. Surface albedo, of course, if it's below zero uh, temperatures, you will have snow and ice. So you have a high albedo. If it's above um, freezing, you don't. Solar respiration rates, shown here, again, have a correlation with temperature. Um, the hydrological cycle, mainly driven by temperature, by the temperature contrast between um, temperature on land and the ocean. So land temperature, very important, and land-ocean coupling. The main point here is that if we don't understand temperature on land, we don't understand a lot of other things, right? So it's very important. Um, so what I'm focusing on during the last couple of years is the, focusing on peat and reconstruct and then apply novel methods to reconstruct the terrestrial ecosystem, mainly focusing on, on uh, temperature and um, methane cycling. And the reason why I focus on peat is that there are several reasons why I'm doing it. Uh, one of it is that peats are pretty much found across the world. If you have a system that can accumulate enough water, you will get a peat. You get peat in the high Arctic, down to the tropics, um, and in between. Peats can almost be found everywhere. 
Um, what's good for being an organic geochemist is that they're really rich in organic matter, very abundant organic matter. So you have plenty of material to play with, which, which is which is quite nice. Um, peat's also preserved preserved over millions to tens to even more than hundred million years uh, as lignite and coal. And those are often mined in many places, so it's easy access. You don't need expensive drilling campaigns to get samples. What's also important is that they're dominated by in-situ biomarker production. What this means is that all the molecules um, that we find in peat, or the vast majority of that, is actually produced in that peat core at that location. When you focus on, for example, marine sediments, things can wash in from hundreds to thousands of kilometers away, and that can complicate things. In peat, things are produced in that place. So that's a really main advantage. And also we focus on peats because actually they're really, they play a, play a crucial role uh, in terrestrial biogeochemistry in the methane cycle. So peatlands are the biggest natural source of methane, both in the greenhouse gas. Um, and I will talk later, uh, later in my talk, I will talk about um, how we can actually gain insight into how this methane cycle has changed over time. So I will first focus on how temperature has changed and I will show you the development of new methods, how to do that and then apply them. And then I will talk a little bit about how we can uh, use biomarkers to um, because of change in methane cycle, for example. So first temperature. So the first aspect of this talk is focusing on developing a new peat specific organic geochemical temperature proxies and calibrations. So basically developing new methods, how we can reconstruct temperature specific for peace, because those didn't really exist when we started this work. Um, so I've talked about already like biomarkers, molecular fossil, but I just want to take a step back and actually uh, explain to you what actually is a molecular fossil. So I think most of you are familiar with the concept on the left, uh, the fossilization. So you have a fish or another animal, it could be a dinosaur, it could, could be anything, it could be a human. Um, and when they die, they can be be preserved in the sediments and no, normally their uh, fossils remain. So the soft, soft tissue degrades, but like the bones um, can survive, right? And what you can see also here that the fossil looks a little bit like the fish, fish but some, some aspects are missing, right? Um, and the same goes for molecules. So this fish also produces molecules during its life. As to you and I, for example, this is a, a key uh, biomarker uh, for humans, this is cholesterol, um, can be problematic sometimes. And again, also this molecule, uh, after the organism dies, can be preserved in the sediment over time, um, just as, a, a, as the fossil is not exactly the same as the fish, uh, also the molecular fossil is not exactly the same as the biological molecule. So you can see these functional groups like this hydroxy group here, or the double bond here, those are being lost, but the carbon skeleton remains. Um, and again, as a fossil can be preserved over, over a long time, molecular fossils can be preserved even longer. Uh, currently, the oldest um, molecular fossil is 1.6 billion years old. Um, and a lot of our understanding of early evolution of organisms is actually based on molecular fossils. So they're very stable for a very long time. And what is amazing is that these biomolecules hold information on who was producing them, but also what the conditions were. And that information is, again, it's preserved in the sediment. So that's what we're going to use, this concept of a molecular fossil. So in this first part of the talk, I'm going to focus on one key uh, molecular fossil uh, called a branched glycerol diacyl glycerol tetraether. Now, that sounds all very complicated, but we just call it a branch EDDT. Um, and it comes in many different forms and shapes, and you don't really have to remember that. Um, the main thing you have to remember is that it comes um, in different forms with different amounts of methyl groups. So this is sort of the basic structure of a branch EDT with four of these methyl groups here in the middle. Um, but th these, and I forgot to mention, these are produced by bacteria. Uh, these bacteria can also add an additional methyl group here, or they can do add an additional methyl group here and here, right? So we have three main groups. We have uh, branch EDTs consisting of four methyl groups, the ones with five methyl groups, and the ones with six methyl groups. And we call those uh, groups 1A, 2A, and 3A. Why are we interested in those? Well, we know for mineral soils, so not in peat, but on mineral soils, the distribution of these compounds depends on the climatic state. For example, if I take a soil from Nigeria, I analyze it, I can see that it's dominated by the branch GDT 1A. So this one with it, 
which has just the fourth method. If we then go to Iceland, where it's cold, Nigeria being hot, in Iceland it's cold, you can see the distribution is very different. In Iceland, you can see that it's dominated by this compound with one additional methyl groups, and we even see uh, the compound with two additional methyl groups, right? So the degree of methylation, how many methyl groups this compound has, changes depending on the climate state. And you can capture these changes in this methylation, a degree of methylation in index called MVT, and when we plot this for mineral soils versus temperature, and this is work done in, uh, published in 2007, you get this sort of linear correlation between temperature and the degree of methylation. Now that work was all based on mineral soils and we didn't have an idea if actually it worked in peat. And actually some of the earlier work suggested it might be actually really complicated in peat. Um, so when I started this project, the aim was to actually see, does this actually work in peat? Because we know peat can be preserved, uh, over the Holocene, we can, they can be preserved over millions of years. So actually, it would be a really useful tool. So uh, as part of this project, uh, I collaborate with, collaborated with um, peat researchers, researchers from across the world. Uh, and we collected peat samples from basically every continent besides Antarctica, uh, although we are a bit biased to Western Europe um, and the East Coast of the United States, because that's where a lot of our collaborators um, come from. But in total, we collected uh, 470 peat samples over the top meter of the peat core, uh, focusing on almost 100 peatlands. And the main point here is that we have a sample from each peat forming environment we have on Earth. From the Arctic, with a mean annual temperature of minus eight, to the tropics in Indonesia, with 27 degrees. We have very acidic peats, with a pH down to three, to alkaline peats, peats with a pH of H, uh, eight. Although I want to say that most peats we have have a pH of roughly between four and six. And in each of these samples, we measure the distribution of these molecules, the branch GTDTs produced by bacteria. And what you see is that uh, when we look into a uh, peat from the Tibetan plateau, where it's cold, mean annual air temperature of around one degrees because it's a high elevation, you see that we have a mixture of branch GTDs consisting of 1A, 2A, and 3A. So we have all three of them. We then look at a peat from, Fra from France, so it's in mid latitudes, a bit warmer, meaning I know air temperature of around 11 degrees. You can see this distribution changing, where we start to see the compound with only the four methyl groups becoming dominant. And then when we go to a peatland from the Amazon, where it is very warm at around the temperature, mean annual air temperature of around 25 degrees we can see that it's dominated by the, the 1A compound, right? So what we saw, saw in mineral soils, we see the same also in peat, that the temperature has a direct uh, impact on the degree of methylation of these compounds. And we can put this into, um, into an index, which is now changed uh, slightly. It's called the MPT 5 methyl prime index. But basically, it's a ratio of the branch EDTs with uh, no additional methyl groups over those with one and two additional methyl groups. And when we plot this, uh, this index versus, uh, versus temperature, we get the following graph. So here we have temperature on the y-axis and the MBT index on the x-axis. And you can see this linear correlation with peats from the tropics, where it's warm. We can see they have a, um, a high MBT index and peats uh, from these cold regions like Siberia have a low index. Uh, and then we can come up with a linear cal calibration uh, here with an R squared of 0.76 and a, a residual error of around four and a half degrees. So what we now have for the first time is a tool that we can reconstruct and quantify temperature in peats. So how does it look like? Well, let's focus on the Holocene to start with. Uh, and this is a Holocene peat from uh, northeastern China from, the, uh, from Hani here. Um, so here we have India, here we have China. Uh, northeastern China. And this peat in here spans roughly the last 17,000 years. So it spans the whole Holocene and actually reaches into the deglaciation. And when we measured the uh, brand GDT distribution in all these samples and then applied our calibration that we just uh, developed, uh, we got the following temperature profile. So what you see is temperatures uh, vary from around minus five, minus six during the glacial. So here we have Heinrich Stadium one, very cold. We got a warming, we got a cooling during the Younger Dryas, warming into the Holocene climatic optimum, and then the cooling. And this temperature evolution, we can in this speed, and actually looks very similar, for example, what we know from other places uh, on Earth. For example, this is the Greenland ice core, 
right? So this, where you have this really dramatic uh, cooling during the Heinrich stadia on the younger dryers. Uh, and this is a northern hemisphere temperature uh, anomaly uh, calculation. This is sort of like the global temperature in the northern hemisphere. Again, we have like low temperatures during the Heinrich stadia on the younger dryers and then warming, which is what we see uh, here as well. It's important to notice, like if we look into temperatures for the top of the peak, the, the top few centimeters, we get temperatures around uh, six degrees, which is the same as the modern day temperature at that location. So the modern day temperature is around, uh, I think it's 5.7 degrees. So this is this dashed line here. And you can see in the top of the peak, we reconstruct modern day temperatures. But during the Holocene climatic optimum, so around four to six, maybe 8,000 years ago, it was actually significantly warmer at this location. Um, maybe five, six degrees warmer. And during the glacial and the Heineken state, it was much, much colder. And especially these colder temperatures are much colder than what we see in the marine realm around this location. And it's probably because this terrestrial side gets influenced from, from Siberia bringing, with the westerlies bringing really cold, cold air in. And that's also supported by modeling uh, work that we present in this paper. So this is an example of how we can now quantify temperature on land using biomarkers and using the tools we developed. Um, and this one from Hani uh, that we've published, I'm currently working on a lot of other records, especially from the Southern Hemisphere. So all these stars is where we're currently um, trying to generate and quantify temperature change across the deglaciation. And we have some records already from Patagonia. Uh, we have records from South America. Uh, currently working on a record from Easter Island. So hopefully in the next four years, we're gonna have lots of terrestrial quantified temperature records, starting into fill, uh, fill in some of the dots, actually how the terrestrial um, ecosystem responded to the, la the last deglaciation. So, so far we've mainly talked about uh, recent climate change, like the deglaciation, the Holocene, which is all relatively recent, but using these, uh, these methods, we can also go further back in time. And just to give you an example, um, for example, look into the early Paleo genes. This is a project we did, we did a few years ago together with uh, postdocs in our group, uh, Gordon and Megan, and focusing on the early paleo genes. So, this was a period around 50 million years ago, which was a, a general, <coughs> sorry, but it was a granular greenhouse, a general greenhouse period with much higher CO2 levels. But one of the key problems for this time period was that the existing temperature proxies didn't match with the temperature proxy we had on uh, from the marine world. So there was this mismatch between terrestrial temperatures and marine temperatures for this time period. Um, so what we set out to do is, together with a range of collaborators, was actually apply our methods we developed for peat to, to lignites to reconstruct terrestrial temperature during this greenhouse period. And for this, we uh, collected lignites from New Zealand, from India, uh, from the United Kingdom, and, and from Germany. And we applied our proxies um, to see what temperature we cut. Um, and these results were published in Nature Geoscience uh, two years ago. Um, the main figure is this figure here, which is maybe a bit complex. So basically what you see here is uh, latitude going from the Arctic to the Antarctic and temperature on the y-axis. Gray is the modern day temperature and all the different colors are temperature reconstruction for the early paleogene for um, this greenhouse world. And the new temperature estimates from our lignites are the stars. And what you see in uh, several places like here in Europe um, and also here in New Zealand, what you see is that our new temperature estimates are actually significantly warmer than the existing temperature estimates. And for the first time, we could also give some indication of how warm the tropics got. So this is from India, data from India. You can see that India, uh, we have some other evidence that I don't show in this figure. Actually, India was significantly warmer than today, maybe uh, 35 degrees. But the main image, uh, the main finding from this paper is like that these mid-latitude sites were significantly warmer than based on the other proxies. So that's why the title of this paper was that we have very high temperatures in the terrestrial mid-latitude during this greenhouse period of the early paleogene. Um, now this was already warm, but we actually had uh, warmer periods during the Cenozoic, during the hyperthermal, such as for example, the Paleocene Eocene thermal maximum or ETM2. Um, and currently, uh, I, I have Victoria, who was a postdoc working with me, was actually looking into reconstructing, again, using the same um, proxies we, we developed, trying to understand how temperature in the high Arctic, this is Ellesmer Islands, which is located in the Arctic next to Greenland, um, how that responded to these really uh, warm hyperthermal events. So here we have the PTM, 
where we see temperatures in the high Arctic, so this is like around 75, 80 degrees uh, latitude, temperatures reach between 10 and 20 degrees Celsius, right, where present day temperatures are below freezing. Um, then you see lower temperatures outside the hyperthermals. And then during ETM2, where we have the beautiful onset, you can see like within a few meters, you see this rapid warming from temperature around 10 degrees to 20 degrees. So you see this rapid warming during this hyperthermal um, and then a cooling again. And also if you look at the relative timing here, um, what you can see is that actually the warming here starts before we see the change in the carbon isotopes. And that can give us crucial insights into what is actually driving uh, this, this, this event. Um, and this is currently work Victoria is, is writing up currently. So this will give you some snippets of what we can do with modern biomarker proxies, um, developing those in modern peats and then applying them to the past, trying to increase our understanding of how temperatures on land have changed some, during some of the key events um, across the same world. So that was temperature, but I'm also really interested in deconstructing uh, biogeochemistry and especially change, uh, change in the methane cycle. And the reason is that methane is a really potent greenhouse gas and can play quite a big role in our climate system. And wetlands are the largest natural source uh, of methane. Um, so what I'm specifically interested in is trying to reconstruct changes into uh, the oxidation of methane. So in wetlands, we have lots of, lots of methane production into the, um, the anaerobic, so the anoxic part of the peat. Uh, and some of that methane is oxidized into the oxic part, into the aerobic, the oxic part of the peat uh, uh, by methanotrophs. So these are organisms that eat methane. And this process is actually quite complex. So here you can see how methane gets oxidized slowly into carbon dioxide by methanotrophs. And there's two different pathways they can do that. But you can imagine that the amount of methane oxidation that's happening here is a key gateway of how much methane escapes into the atmosphere. If there's a lot of consumption of methane here, a little bit of methane makes into the atmosphere. If there's very little consumption, a lot of methane, right? So this is a, a key gateway uh, of methane, controlling the flux of methane out of wetlands, right? So methanotrophs are very important. So how can we use biomarkers to provide new insights uh, into uh, the methane cycle. So for this, we're going to use a different type of biomarker, the hopanoids that look like this. So lots of rings here. Uh, and hopanoids are produced by a lot of different bacteria. Uh, this just gives you an oversight of the different bacteria phyla that actually have the gene to make a hopanoid. And you see it's quite widely distributed, like ranging from alpha proteobacteria to acetobacteria to cyanobacteria. A lot of them can make uh, hopanoids. And some of these are actually methanotrophs, so they eat methane. But the important thing is that hopanes are produced by a whole range of bacteria, heterotrophic bacteria and methanotrophic bacteria. But we can use the carbon of composition of hopanes to actually gain some insight. And the reason is that if you are methanotroph, so you eat methane, your carbon of composition will be very light because the carbon of composition of methane is very depleted. If you're a heterotroph, and you eat organic matter, like organic matter, for example, produced by plants, um, that organic matter is much more enriched in carbon isotopes, so your carbon isotope composition will be more enriched. So just to give you an idea, if you have a bacterial community that's dominated by methanotrophs, so dominated by bacteria that eat methane, the carbon isotopes will be very depleted because they're eating carbon, methane, that is very depleted. So then the hopanoids in our sample will be very depleted. We'll have a carbon isotope composition maybe less than 40 per mil. If you then go to the other extreme where your um, community is dominated by heterotrophs, by heterotrophic bacteria, they mainly eat organic matter that consists of a carbon isotope composition of minus 15 to minus 30. Um, your hopanoids will actually have a carbon isotope composition that's heavier, right? So if you have a very light carbon isotope composition, that means we have lots of methanotrophs. If it's very, if it's more heavy, we have more heterotrophs. Okay, this is the theory. Let's actually look into modern day peat. So we use a subset of our peat database that we use for the branch EDGs and actually measure the carbon isotope composition of the different hopanoids in each of these sites. And what you see here is the carbon isotope composition of hopanes of different hopanoids um, and how many of those. And basically what you see is most peats, uh, when you look at the C31 hopanes, 
you see they have this dominant signal between minus 20 and minus 35. Uh, the C30 hopines and the hopines are slightly lighter, but overall in a modern day wetland, most of your hopines indicate carbon isotopes between minus 20 and minus 35. There's a few that are a bit lighter, right? Um, so that indicates in a modern peat, your bacterial community is dominated by heterotrophs. Doesn't mean methanotrophs are not there. Methanotrophs are there, that is not dominant, right? That's modern day. Let's go look into the past. Like actually, can we detect changes in this, which would reflect change in the methane cycle? Uh, so for this, we're gonna go back to the honey peat, the one that I introduced earlier, where we generated the temperature record. Uh, so this is a peat from Northeastern China. Uh, we have here the degliciation, uh, a temperature record. What we can now do is also look into the carbon isotopes. There's a lot of other records here, but I wanna focus here on top into the diploptene carbon isotopes when the plotting uh, being uh, a, a hoponoid. And what you see is that throughout this period, the last 14, 15,000 years, actually the carbon isotope composition of the hopanes did not significantly change. And basically it ranged up in this range in this uh, around minus 34, minus 35 per mil. So a dominance of a heterotrophic bacterial community throughout the time at this point. And other peats we actually don't see that. This is published work uh, from a collaborator in China. Uh, we actually see in this peat, then this is a, a different peat than in China. You actually, during the, the middle Holocene, between four uh, and 6,000 years ago, you see actually this depletion in the diploptene carbon isotopes that values maybe as light as minus 50, suggesting that at this time, we actually have a perturbation uh, of the methane cycle. You have much more methanotrophs which we suggest there was much more methane to have an activated methane cycle during this event. So this is the Holocene, but we can actually go further back in time. Um, <clears throat> and this is the last graph I'm gonna show you. This is our modern day data set with the different hoppings and the carbonized of the composition here on the y-axis. And for the modern day wetlands, basically everything ranges between <clears throat> minus 25 and minus 40. So dominance of a heterotrophic bacterial community. Then go to the Holocene, you can see that most of them are in a similar range, uh, a heterotrophic community, but between four and 6,000 years, you can see like the speed then from China, you can see slightly more depleted values indicated a more uh, intense methane cycle here. I mean, you can now go a step further and actually look for the entire Cenozoic. So this is the last 65 million years. So you have the KPG boundary when the dinosaurs were, were extinct. Now we have this uh, evolution of climate going from greenhouse periods here to now the, um, the, greenhouse, the ice house world we currently live in with ice on both poles. And we're currently measuring carbon isotopes in different uh, lignites from across this time period. And what you can see is that for the vast majority of the last 65 million years, mm -hmm. carbon isotopes of our hopanes are almost always the same as we see in modern day peats indicating a dominant, dominance of a heterotrophic bacterial community. The only exception is these hyperthermals, the PTM and the ETM too, where we saw this high latitude warming, this rapid warming. At the same time, we also see our carbon isotopes getting very depleted. The values may be as low as minus 70. So just during those events, we suddenly get a really big change in the methane cycle, a key feedback mechanism. And we're currently filling this in to actually get a complete record across the Cenozoic. But this is for the first time providing us insights into how terrestrial biogeochemistry has varied over time. Okay, so I hope I've convinced you in the past uh, half an hour that uh, biomarks are a very powerful tool uh, to um, reconstruct temperature and biogeochemistry on land. For the first time, provide us insights into how the terrestrial realm has responded to climatic change over the last 65 million years. Um, and that's the end of my presentation. If you want to contact me, you can do so via Twitter. Uh, you can explore my website or just drop me an email if you have any questions uh, or think about collaborations or anything. And this is on the background here is a picture I took uh, on the weekend is how Bristol looks in, in, in the fog. Uh, the university is somehow here on the right, you can see, um, which was a beautiful sunny day. Uh, and with that, I want to acknowledge all of my collaborators uh, and funding agencies and you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you so much, David. That was a, a really, really fascinating talk. 
considering I know a lot of your work, I, I still, uh, it was really interesting. So thank you for that. Um, so if there are any questions, can you please uh, post them in the chat, either on the Zoom chat or the, the um, YouTube chat, please. There aren't any questions that I can see. I don't know if Lint uh, can confirm that, but I think there are no questions. I think Brian, no anyone questions. can. <laughs> I'll be useful. Um, I, yeah, that, that was that was really cool. That was that was great. I'd see, I'd seen some of that work before, and um, yeah, it's, I mean it's 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 uh, highly promising to say the least. Obviously, um, I was wondering about. Um, it seemed to me. Um, that the, to what extent are you, are you confident that your quantified reconstruction of temperature isn't kind of a disembodied index and that it is actually indicating those specific temperature values? Um, I see that you, I mean, you calibrated it on modern and that's always um, heartwarming. Um, but I wonder, have you, have you compared it with other um, independent records over longer time periods in different parts of the world to see if there isn't some um, potential either to refine the calibration or if there are maybe some slight differences or anomalies. I mean, so yeah, I mean, that, I mean, that's a good question, right? I mean, so we have like a modern day uh, calibration data set, um, uh, which gives us confidence. And, and this is also supported by, by other, like, I mean, there's like decades of research that shows that these, the distribution of these uh, compounds depend on temperature among, among other things. Um, one of the downsides is that we don't know exactly who is making them. We know it's probably acida bacteria, but we're not completely sure. Uh, so we can't culture because the next step would be to culture these bacteria and grow them in a culture, but we can't do that because we don't know who's making it. Um, and actually a lot of the acida bacteria are not cultured at all. Uh, so, so, so that's like uh, so a major part of research, not, not by me, but of other people. And so it's actually trying to find out who's producing that. Um, so that would be useful, but but like in a modern day, we can see it works. And if you give me, a, if you show me a distribution of these compounds anywhere in the world, I can tell you what the temperature is. I mean, this works really well in the modern day across. I mean, it works in lakes. It works. I mean, there's now also lake calibration, but it works in lakes. It works in peats. It works in soils. It works really well. Um, I mean, there's still uncertainties we can drill down. Like what? Like there are some other factors that we, we can spend an entire talk, uh, uh, hour talking about this, but. But, but the main message, like it, it works um, really robustly in modern day uh, settings as well as paleo. And I mean, the temperature we get for the Holocene, for example, those agree with other estimates, right? I mean, this is like, what, what, what we get is like the evolution, like what, you, what I showed you, like we have the Younger Dryas, the Heinrich Stadel, the Boiling Underworld. We have the evolution we would expect from it. It's not like we get like something completely wrong is happening. And like, it makes sense with mechanics. We just, we using uh, pollen-based reconstructions that we've worked on in, in Southern Africa. And I, I, what leads me to the question is that sometimes we get uh, reconstructions that if you, if you don't look at the y-axis, you're like, oh yeah, that's, you know, that's fantastic. Yeah, you, you know, last glacial maximum, young dryas, pulp mallard, mm -hmm. all these things. Brilliant, this is working. Except that the reconstruction range is like 0.3 degrees Celsius. <laughs> so the shape of the curve works really well but the absolute values are not. Um, but I, and, and I don't mean that as a, as a point of criticism, I'm just saying that this is why I'm always wondering. What's, what's the South African site that you are looking at for the peat, do you know? Oh, it's Amphabe, um, I probably pronounced oh, it. Yeah, Amphabe, yeah. yeah. It's, it's with the people in Stellenbosch uh, okay. working on that. Right, I was gonna say, we should be in touch because we've got lots of peats around there. Oh. And we do have independent records that you could, we could try a little calibration just to mm. see, you know, it's not sphagnum peat, but. It doesn't, I mean, I mean, yeah, exactly. I mean, but I mean, for, for the Amphibane peat, um, we actually have, like, again, we have like modern day temperatures in the top of the core, like what we want to see. We have like a beautiful deglaciation. Um, it, it works really well there as well. Uh, and that goes back to 40,000, I think. So. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, yeah, no, sure. Yeah, it's like, it would be interesting to to have like other records from the same place to actually do. Yeah, happy. And it's really easy to measure 
in piece, these these things. I mean, that chuck that chuck for it's really analytically pretty simple to measure. If, if you I, have to I know Lynn Quick is listening in in one of these boxes as well, and she does a lot of work on the on the coastal wetlands. Um, okay. Yeah. 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 Let's let's be in touch. I think that'd be really cool. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Thank you, Brian. Um, there is another question, David, on the chat. Um, I don't know if you can read it. Um, are there yeah, any about the Cretaceous? Yes. Yes. Yeah. I mean, that's so. So, yes. Very good can question. You just, can you just uh, read it out because the the people in um, oh. in YouTube may not actually know what the question is. Okay, I will read it out. So the question is, are there any limitations in using brand GTTs for the reconstructing Cretaceous greenhouse climate? Um, this, is a, this is a really good question. Currently working a lot on the Cretaceous. Um, so one of the limitations of this particular uh, method is that brand GTTs are pretty sensitive uh, compounds to thermal maturity. If you start to bury something really deep and you get like an increase in temperature because of burial, um, these compounds will break apart. So lignites, which are immature, it works well. It works well. If you go to a coal, we start to lose them. So I have not come. So we have KPG. We currently have KPG, so the boundary of the Cretaceous and the Paleogene. We have KPG records at the moment. It works there. Uh, I've never seen a Cretaceous lignite. There's a lot of Cretaceous coals, but Coals are too thermally mature. They've been buried too deep uh, to contain brand GDTs. If you have a Cretaceous lignite, I'm very happy to look into it because so the main thing is like actually trying to find the right material that is not buried deep enough. But if you have an immature coal, maybe somewhere in India, could very well be, I would be very happy to, um, to work on that because that would be really promising uh, to do. So Yes, if anybody has any lignite at all, just feel free to drop me an email. I'm always collecting samples from everywhere uh, to measure them. Um, and it's really easy to check. We can check on like, uh, it's super easy to check if we have them. Uh, but yeah, if you, have, if you have immature lignites from the Cretaceous, I'll be very happy. The hoppings are super stable. Those get preserved over more than a billion years. So the, carb so the carbon cycle bit, we can definitely do that in the Cretaceous. Although I don't think anybody's ever done that in the Cretaceous, but that would be super cool to do as well. Yeah, I just want to add, uh, David, enough. Uh, like uh, we do have some peat deposits in Kerala also in India, in the western part. So uh, that is also belongs to Cenozoic period. So I was just curious to know which part of India you have used in your studies. Now we, that uh, the nature geoscience that you had pointed. Uh, some. Oh, um, I have to think. Could it be? Maybe I'm wrong, but I, I have to read the paper again. But I think, I, it, uh, could it be from the Kumar Basin? Does that make sense? Oh, yeah, Kumar. Yeah, yeah, all right. Okay. Yeah. That's what I think they were from. But we, but, yeah, but uh, we have some Chinese collaborate, uh, not Chinese, in, in Indian collaborators that provide it. But I think it's, a, it's in the supplement of the paper where they're from and everything. Um, okay. so, so, so do take, but yeah, if you have, if you have more Cenozoic. Even since I'm happy for lake nights across, like I'm, I'm always, as Angela knows, I'm always asking Angela for peatlands. Like if you, if you have lake nights from Cenozoic or Cretaceous, and I would be very happy to, to, to look into this and, and collaborate. I think Brian is offering some from South Africa, some lake night. Oh, yeah. perfect. <laughs> perfect. Okay. Yeah. Just drop me an email, just email me. I will, I will collect everything. <laughs> Thank you. David, um, I, I wondered if you could share your, I have a question if there is no other questions in the chats that I cannot see. I wonder if we could go back to your 2018 Nature Geoscience paper. I just, um, I don't know if you can share it again. Yeah, you. I can uh, I can do that. I was just uh, wondering because I noticed that you had the line where the, um, the max, um, is that where the GDDT's uh, reconstruction max, uh, max is out? Yes, Is so that that's a good question. Line? Yeah. Yeah. No, so, so uh, yeah, at, at uh, 29.3, I think, from top of math, um, the index maxes out. The MBT cannot go beyond one. It's an index between zero and one, uh, and it's one at 29.1 degrees. So we cannot, so that's why in this here, India suggests temperatures are actually around 29 because they're maxing out. In this paper, we have additional biomark evidence, completely different biomark evidence that I didn't want to go into, but it actually suggested India was significantly warmer than 29 degrees. Actually, India was much warmer than any place we currently have on Earth. 
uh, and probably it's more like 34, 35 degrees. Um, but yeah, the limit is 29, so it's not super useful for tropical reconstructions in greenhouse climates because we're just maxing out. Um, so that's, that's a limitation for the proxy, um, sadly. But like I said, there's other evidence in the paper that suggests it was clearly much warmer um, than that. And there's almost no data from the tropics, right? I mean, yeah. there was just another paper actually from, uh, um, from um, another Dutch um, guy uh, who just published in Nature Geoscience about tropical temperatures during the same period. Uh, that was published like, I think two weeks ago in Nature Geoscience and he has temperatures up to 40 degrees in the tropics, wow. um, which makes some, makes some sense with our data as well. So actually the tropics were probably significantly warmer than this. And what about that, that uh, mid-latitude star? Do you think that's maxed out or is just uh, still within the calibration? So range? this one is still like, it's not maxed out. These are not maxed out, but they're getting close to it. Um, but no, those are not completely maxed out, but they're getting close to it. So, so yeah, um, because, so even, which is quite surprising, right? I mean, this is like at 60 degrees latitude. So this is like New Zealand. And we have like temperatures of like really 28, 29 degrees. And this, I mean, I don't show it in this, in this graph, but also the marine temperatures from off the coast of New Zealand suggest such warm temperatures. Um, the problem is we have no idea how you can actually get temperatures that warm in that place. And that's like a whole, that's a major problem, but that, that's another point. Yeah, really interesting. Thank you, David, for that clarification. Um, I don't know if there are no more questions. We'll have a five minute break before we introduce our next talk that will be by Tom Sim. So, um, Thank you again, David. I really, really enjoyed the talk. Uh, really good. Uh, very, very easy to understand. Thank you for coming down to our level so we could understand it. No, um, thank you very much. And like I say, if you need, if you, like if people have samples, I will just put my uh, email address in the chat. If, like just contact me and we can talk about like what, what, what we can do. Um, I, can, yeah. I can copy it across to uh, the YouTube as well, if you put it there, yes. Perfect. Thank you, David. Thank you, bye. Bye-bye. Okay, so I we have five minutes. So if, um, like me, you would like a cup of tea or uh, have a loo break, this is the moment. And we will come back in about four minutes when I will introduce Tom, our next speaker. Great, Angela. Thank you.
So um, I'm gonna now introduce our next speaker, uh, Tom. Good, I see him. <laughs> He's there. Um, hi. hi. So this is uh, Tom Sin, uh, who is doing a PhD at the Geography Department of the University of Le Leeds in UK, and he's gonna. Uh, talk to us about tested amoeba as indicators of past ecological change in Arctic peatlands. Um, and with this, I'll let Okay, so can you see my presentation there, Angela? Yes, yes. yes. Okay. Excellent. Okay, we'll just set that off. So, yeah, as Angela said, I'm Tom, um, University of Leeds, I'm a PhD student there. Um, my supervisors are Graham Swindles, Paul Morris and Andy Baird. Um, and uh, I'm gonna be talking to you about test data amoeba and how they can be used as indicators of past environmental change, particularly um, in relation to Arctic peatlands. So starting things off, why are we interested in peatlands? Other than being um, having biodiversity and a variety of ecosystem services, um, peatlands store a large amount of carbon. So um, you can see here, I've got a map of northern peatlands on the right here. Um, and these northern peatlands store around 500 gigatons of carbon. So this is equivalent to roughly two thirds of all the carbon in the atmosphere, just for some context. Um, and this is split between permafrost peatlands and non-permafrost peatlands. Permafrost, um, permafrost peatlands are just underlaid by um, frozen ground, essentially. Um, so there's a lot of peatlands in North America, um, I'm not sure if you can see my cursor, but over here, um, and in Russia, uh, Siberia, um, and also uh, temperate Europe. Um, and the, these carbon stores have built up over the Holocene um, because there's been an imbalance between productivity and decomposition. So productivity has been greater than decomposition, and therefore the peat has built up. Um, so we need to understand what's going to happen to this carbon that's stored in these peatlands um, in the 21st century as the planet warms, essentially. So is productivity going to increase or is decomposition going to increase? Is this going to vary in time and space? And um, doing paleoenvironmental studies can be key in understanding that. And test data amoeba are a really useful proxy um, that can be used in these past environmental studies that look at decadal, centennial, even millennial um, change in the past um, that will improve our understanding. But more on that as we go through today's talk. So first of all, what are test state amoeba? They are a uh, unicellular amoeboid protest uh, with a test that partially encloses the cell. So a bit of a mouthful, but um, we'll break it down. So you can see here in the bottom left, we've got a test state amoeba from the genus Netzelia. Um, the test encompasses the amoeba as a protective shell. Um, there's an aperture from, from which the amoeba pokes through its pseudopodium. Um, and so just breaking this down, a protist is a eukaryotic organism that is not a uh, plant, fungi or animal, um, typically singular celled. An amoeba is a protist that moves by cytoplasmic streaming. This is movement within the cell. Um, kind of imagine how a slug or a snail would move along um, like that. And uh, testate is, just means the shell. So this can be uh, idiosomic, which is secreted by the amoeba, or it can be, uh, this can be calcareous, uh, silicious or organic, or it can be xenogenic, which is from the surrounding environment. So small sediment particles, um, diatoms, bits of other testate amoeba sometimes. Um, so here we've got, uh, some common species of testate amoeba, just to give you an idea of the, the morphological diversity we've got here, typically have one aperture. The species in the top left there is um, Archella flavum, that has two apertures, which is quite unusual and interesting. Um, but this kind of gives you a flavour of the different shapes that we have going on, basically, the different organisms that we're interested in. Um, you might be thinking, what are testate amoeba still? Well, uh, we'll just go through the basics a little bit to, to fill that that gap in. So they have a global distribution um, found all over the world, found in nearly all uh, moist uh, aquatic environments, freshwater and marine. Of these freshwater habitats, predominantly found in lakes, rivers, soils and peatlands, which is what I'm interested in. Um, they're typically between 50 and 100 microns, so really small. Um, uh, this is about a tenth to a twentieth of a millimetre. Um, you need to look at them under a light microscope. 
Um, but they can range from as small as 10 microns to 500 microns, which is half a millimetre, just about what you'd be able to see with your naked eye. Um, a bit about their ecology, they're free living organisms, so they consume, at, predominantly anyway, um, they consume bacteria, fungi and algae, sometimes other testate amoeba. Some species even have a symbiotic relationship with photosynthetic algae and get some energy from that. Um, finally on this, they're really abundant. So there's a large biomass of these organisms in the world. Um, and for example, if you were to take uh, five centimeters cubed of surface moss from a peatland, you, there's gonna be thousands of individuals likely to be in there. Um, so how can these be useful in paleoecology? Well, testate amoeba are really sensitive to the environment in which they're found in particularly to moisture conditions. So the dominant species will vary depending whether it's wet or dry, for example, but they also respond to other factors such as pH differences, changes in electrical conductivity, sometimes even salinity and things like that. Um, crucially, the tests that surround the amoeba um, preserve very well, um, particularly in peat, and they can be uh, preserved for thousands of years. Um, which is obviously very useful for paleoecology. Um, and linked to this, um, during life, testate amoeba are limited to the surface to the top few centimetres of the peatland by the availability of light and oxygen. So that means that you've got living, living organisms at the surface, and then these are preserved as you go down um, a peatland core. Uh, there's a picture here from uh, Svalbard last summer uh, where we're taking uh, a permafrost peatland core uh, there. So kind of just going on this train of thought, really simple conceptual diagram here. You take your core, you subsample your core, further down the core is older. So the older the peat is, the further down it is. We can date these using uh, lead 210, 14C, radiocarbon dating, um, or tephrochronology. So that's um, volcanic ash deposits. Um, and each slice or subsample of the peat will have a biological fingerprint um, that these test that the composition of these test amoeba provides, and it provides a window into the past of these past environmental conditions. Um, but of course, the present is the key to the past. It's that old adage. We need to know what environments these test amoeba are found in today to be able to predict what environments they represent or suggest were there in the past. Um, so there's typically three stages to this, um, and it's developing a transfer function essentially. So um, you measure the environmental variables where you find your test data meter on the surface of the peatland. So these are typically water table depth, the moisture content, pH, um, electrical conductivity, um, and potentially other variables that you might be interested in. Um, you then go take your surface moss and you view it uh, under the microscope in the lab, and you look for the species composition of the test state amoeba, do that for each of your samples. You then use statistical modeling, um, which is generally a variation of weighted averaging, which is quite simple statistically, um, and apply this, uh, sorry, and then you can test the performance of your model, pick the best one, and apply it then to the uh, paleo data sets. Um, so just kind of conceptually, that's what we're dealing with here. There's been a lot of work on this in the last 20 to 30 years. Um, peatlands around the world, from the tropics, um, to China, New Zealand, Europe, um, North America. Um, and this is due to slight differences in ecosystem and the types of test data amoeba that you find there. Um, so that's why we need these kind of regional transfer functions. Um, and um, that kind of brings me on to Arctic test data amoeba. So while the distribution of test set amoeba is cosmopolitan, it's global. Um, certain species are found in different environments. So if we're looking at tundra and arctic environments, um, these particular species are predominantly found there. So that's central pictures Gasparella in the bottom left here, this uh, really distinct key, keyhole shaped aperture, um, or Conococcus ponticuliformis, which is um, there's some scanning electron microscope imagery there in the bottom right, or compared to what it looks like under a light microscope. So we find different amoeba in different environments, and that kind of leads me on to uh, my research a little bit. Um, but first, before that, um, just something to note about kind of Arctic and permafrost environments. Some recent 
uh, research developing transfer function for permafrost peatlands in Alaska has found that uh, not only do test that amoeba respond to water table depth, which is moisture conditions, um, which is kind of what they're predominantly driven by um, it, around the world, um, they're also uh, responded significantly to uh, electrical conductivity, uh, which can be a proxy for trophic status. So whether these peatlands were mineralotrophic or oligotrophic. Um, so it can be really important for past hydrology, but also for reconstructing um, past uh, fen to bog or bog to fen transitions. Um, so that's what they were able, uh, Taylor et al. were able to do in their 2019 papers. Um, so what I'm doing in my research is looking at the ecology of test state amoeba in Svalbard. Um, so those kind of, so I'm hoping to be able to develop a transfer function for water table depth, but also potentially for trophic status through electri uh, electrical conductivity. Um, you might be asking, why are you looking at, uh, why are you looking at Svalbard? Um, for those of you not familiar with Svalbard, it is, uh, it is a group of islands north of Norway, a really high uh, latitude, about 78 degrees north, um, but it is warmed by the West Spitsbergen current, so it's not necessarily as cold as you might expect for that latitude, but still very cold. Um, the reason that we're interested in Svalbard is because um, it's a region that's warmed by around four degrees in the last century. So it kind of acts as a potential case study for the response of peatlands to warming um, that we might not have seen at other latitudes. Um, so we're interested in seeing if these peatlands are expanding laterally, are they accumulating more peat with warming, has productivity increased? Um, and test that amoeba can be a really important part of this. If we can reconstruct how the water table depth or even the trophic status of these peatlands has changed in recent centuries, then we can help to, uh, that can really help to understand um, their future essentially. So what I'm going to try to do now uh, is play you some drone footage. Might be a little bit glitchy, but hopefully it will give you an idea of the sort of environment in which we're dealing with. So, you just bear with me one second. I feel like it was a bit of a long shot to put this in. So there we go. So this peatland is underlaid by permafrost. You can see in it, it's on a, it's on a slight gradient. You've got these uh, drainage channels in it. There's dominated by brown mosses. You've also got some sphagnum in there. Um, you can see there's a range of drier areas, wetter areas, good for developing our transfer function. I think there's some snowmobile tracks on there, which is a bit of a different story. But um, yeah, you have these vast expanses of, of peat, not necessarily that thick. It could be anywhere from 50 centimetres to one or two metres deep. Um, so the actual amount of peat there is perhaps not significant, but what's happening to it is what we're interested in. You can see us there excited by the toy, the drone. So, so yeah, I went to Svalbard last August to collect this data, um, when we could still do things, but anyway. Uh, and what we did is we measured the environmental uh, variables in the field. So we did a snapshot approach. This is uh, measuring your water table depth, your moisture content, pH, electrical conductivity in the field over a few days. Um, and then uh, we did this kind of over the main ice-free region in Svalbard, where you find these peatlands uh, predominantly. So uh, they're around from the the samples in the in the bottom left to the top right. There, you've got about a fifty-kilometer distance. Um, we did one hundred and six samples um, at twenty-one subsites. Um, so we got a, a large amount of data. Um, and it's important to note just a couple of things about the, the geology, actually. So if you look at those samples in the northeast, that, this is a valley called Sassendalen. Um, and the geology here is underlain by uh, limestone. So um, what is that? That's uh, early Cretaceous to older middle Jurassic limestone, whereas the rest of the study area is un underlain by Cenozoic sandstone. So. I just thought I'd note that because you might, uh, you can see here, these are the environmental variables across all our sites, good range of water table depth, uh, median around 10 centimetres deep, 
we have some quite high pH values for peatlands, and this is the high values there are from predominantly from Sassendale, where there's that limestone geology likely to change the pH. Um, but we have quite fenny peat here, um, but but crucially a good range of environmental variables in our sampling, um, a good range of electrical conductivity as well. So the next step in developing the transfer function is to look at the relative abundance of the test that you in the lab. Um, so to do this, you prepare your samples, you boil them, you filter them, you fill them off, sorry, um, and then you filter it to between 15 and 300 microns. Uh, that's to get to just get rid of things that like small, really fine sediment that will obscure the test amoeba or really large uh, bits of plant material, essentially. You then count 100 of these individuals per sample. Um, this is what's thought to be um, kind of a statistically robust uh, number, um, an industry standard. Um, so I have 106 samples, that's over 10,000 amoebas to count in the lab. I'm about three quarters of the way through that at the moment. So still a little bit to go. Um, but that may be still to come in my, the statistics may still be to come in my research, but I'll use an example from a 2016 paper by uh, Matt Ames Briatel, um, where they developed a, a pan-European transfer function. So there's three, kind of three basic steps to developing your transfer function uh, statistically. First of all, you'd explore the data. So here we've got an ordination plot. Uh, here it's NMDS. Uh, you can see that they've, they've got water table depth and pH as the environmental variables. And then all of these red, uh, these red individual kind of writing uh, bits are uh, the individual species or groupings of test state amoeba. So you can see on the right, you've got you might be able to see uh, this is like tri arc, which uh, represents Trigonopixis arcula. Um, that's a dry species, and that's why it's closer to kind of increased water table depth. So that's the first step get kind of a, um, a visual uh, representation of what's happening with your data. You then develop the transfer function in R um, in the package Rioca, uh, developed by Steve Juggins. Um, and there's four main uh, models that you do uh, to, to see which one performs best. So these, this is weighted averaging, weighted averaging with and without tolerance down weighting, maximum likelihood, uh, modern analog technique, technique. And then you can you can test the performance of, of these models. So you don't necessarily worry about what those are. But the, the key thing here is that you can you can use things like the root mean square error prediction and leave one app analysis um, and also the R squared to judge which model is performing best statistically. Um, once you have the best performing model, you can test it on an independent paleo data set. Um, and then ideally, you'll test your transfer function on a simulated paleo data set as well. And then on a short core, which has accompanying uh, instrumental water table depth measurement. So you can test it against real world data. Um, so once you have your transfer function model, you hopefully have something like this. So if that doesn't make sense, what this is, is um, it's the observed water table depth versus the, uh, which measured in the field, versus the predicted water table depth from the test state amoeba transfer function. The black dots uh, are just the data with the high residual values removed, and the red dots are all the data. So you can see here, Ainsbury et al managed to get quite a good relationship uh, between uh, observed and predicted water table depth. So that means you're able to reconstruct how past water table depth has, um, has changed by these paleo, um, assemblages of test state amoeba. You also get things like this. So this is just the, the water table depth optimum for specific taxa. It kind of helps conceptually to work out how these how these work. So on the left here, we've got taxa with a, high, a higher water table depth or lower water table depth, a wetter water table depth, should we say. Uh, so this would be defluja gramin, for example, has a water table depth of around zero compared to trigonopixis sarcula which is a species associated with drier conditions of around 30, centi uh, 30 centimetres uh, water table depth. So what we're interested in really is uh, the application of these, of, these, um, of these transfer functions. So I've got an example here from the first chapter of my PhD um, where we looked at subarctic permafrost peatlands in northern Sweden near Abisko. Now we took 10 short uh, cores from these peatlands um, and we did a variety of, uh, we used a variety of proxies. So here we used test state amoeba to reconstruct water table depth. We also did plant macrofossils. And then we used the Amesbury 
at our European transfer function to reconstruct this water table depth with, uh, for the test at Amoeba. Um, but the reason I picked out this particular example, so one of the 10 calls we did, um, is just because it, it, it highlights the importance of using multiple proxies. So you can see here, the test at Amoeba water table depth has shown various shifts. So we have, um, we have a shift to, to drier conditions, the greater water table depth, and then to wet conditions. But if you compare that with the plant macrofossil record, we have a uh, consistent sphagnum fuscum uh, presence throughout this time period, uh, the green there on the right. So this shows that, um, and plant macrofossils are, are also a good indicator of, of hydrological conditions, but this just shows how we can get a deeper perspective um, by using multiple proxies. Um, however, as with any past environmental proxy, we've seen this morning in the other talks, um, there can be challenges with the interpretation of the records. So the output of a transfer function typically is a water table depth measurement because test data amoeba are most, most affected by moisture conditions usually. This is what we're reconstructing. Um, but the units used can be misleading um, because we've done a snapshot sampling measurement. We've gone out. Um, over a few days, usually in the summer, um, and we've measured the water table depth. It does the reconstruction water table depth in centimeters doesn't actually um, represent an average seasonal water table depth, for example. So, if you don't take that context into account, it can be misleading. So, the solution to this, um, Swindles et al. in 2015 suggested that you use the z-score residuals. Um, so, this is just the variation of the of of the data in each reconstruction. And that allows you to compare relative shifts between cores as well, without getting hung up necessarily on the exact centimeter value. And that can still be really useful. Um, and secondly, tophonomy can affect test data amoeba. So certain test data amoeba taxa produce less favorably as subfossils than others. So these have been described as weak idiosomic siliceous tests which is typically from the species Euglypha, uh, sorry, the genus Euglypha and the Corypheon trinema uh, grouping of amoeba. Other, other um, genuses like Trachyuglypha are included in that. Um, and what you can do, these are predominantly a dry indicator taxa. So what this means is that if you have a core that reconstructs uh, over thousands of years, these species, uh, the, these particular test data amoeba, these wisps or weak idiosomic silicious tests will preserve less favorably further down, which means that you might have a dry trend recently, which is an artifact of taphonomy because the test data amoeba haven't been able to preserve further down, if that makes sense. So the solution to this is to remove them from these particular taxa from your reconstructions. That's the best thing you can do. The second best thing you can do is to compare the outputs of your transfer function, including them, and then not including them to see if there's any significant difference. The key thing here is just to be aware that these issues do exist. So if we talk through a practical example, how do we overcome these challenges? If we continue the Swedish example from before, um, from the first chapter of my PhD, um, here on the right, you have um, the data from all 10 cores, the water table reconstructions. Um, and here we did, we used the transfer function, including these WISTs, these weak idiosomic solicitors tests. Um, and then we conducted the transfer functions without them. And we found that it made minimal, uh, it didn't really make any difference. Perhaps because here we're actually looking at very recent um, time periods. These are short cores that represent the last few centuries. There may not have been enough time for this um, this artifact of pres this differential preservation to become prevalent in the record. Um, but crucially, we've looked for it and we, we found it doesn't make a difference. Secondly, we've used um, Z scores to represent relative shifts in, in hydrological conditions. So we can pick out where they've where they've dried, where they've um, where they've wetted, um, and we can compare these between cores. So this has allowed us in this case to highlight similar trends between certain sites. So you can see the top five sites there. These permafrost peatlands have undergone drying in recent centuries, um, whereas in the, the central panel there, we have the number of sites that have dried and then re-wetted um, within the last century or so. And at the bottom, we've got two sites which don't actually fit in with any common pattern. 
Um, now, I won't go into this in great detail, but essentially what we've got here is um, permafrost conditions appear to be dictating, localised permafrost conditions appear to be important in determining the, how, how these people's hydrology changes. So um, as uh, potential evaporation has increased recently, um, in, these top, in this top panel, in the drying peatlands, um, these peatlands still have intact permafrost, but they've dried because there's increased evapotranspiration. Whereas in the central panel, these peatlands that have wetted um, may have undergone a permafrost collapse um, and turned into a kind of basin-like structure. So they've reached a threshold point in permafrost thaw, which has undermined kind of the structural um, nature of the, of the peatland that's just collapsed. And then that's changed the drainage. So there could be other factors at play, the other, other things to do with decomposition, how that affects hydraulic conductivity and also changes to drainage. But um, a key factor here is that using test data viewer as a proxy has enabled us to get this deeper understanding and have this discussion about how these permafrost beacons are going to change in the future. So, um, in summary, test data amoeba are a very useful uh, proxy. Uh, they respond, the relative abundances of them um, preserved uh, down core enable you to reconstruct uh, past environmental conditions. So on the whole, they preserve well and provide this biological fingerprint, which we can be we can use to uh, reconstruct past peatland um, hydrology, potentially um, bog to fen transitions and trophic status. Um, certain species are, uh, dominate uh, different regions, and that's why we have these transfer functions, and that's why I'm looking at, um, at Svalbard, these Arctic peatlands. Um, to develop a transfer function and understand how the amoeba, particularly in that environment, respond to different changes. Um, transfer functions are extremely useful for paleoecology studies, um, as I've just said, for past environmental conditions, uh, but other things as well, like trophic status. And crucially, when you're using uh, test state amoeba, as well as any other proxy, you need to give um, consideration to how you're interpreting that, so understand how, you, how the proxy um, works, um, and also any uh, issues to do with taphonomy uh, that, that might be affecting it. So I just want to thank my supervisors, Graham, Paul and Andy, and Angela and the ICAP team for uh, helping with my field work and a whole manner of different things. Um, and has anyone got any questions? Just... Uh... Thank you so much, uh, Tom, for a really, really good talk. I, I look forward to seeing your results when they come out. Um, there is a question from Brian that says, has work been done to apply tested amoeba transfer functions and biomarker techniques like David's to the same core and samples to compare or corroborate reconstructions? So I think that you have probably compared it to other or, or Graham has, I don't know, do you do you have an, an answer to that? Sorry, I think I might have missed the crucial part of that. Have I compared test amoeba reconstructions to other indicators of past hydrology? Is that the question? Yeah, like biomarker techniques like David, David Naffs was, uh, oh. Uh, I, yeah, I was, I was just thinking, um, you know, looking at uh, what, what David had presented and what you have presented and, Thinking, have have the two techniques been applied to the same core in the same samples to see if there's any deviations, tendencies, biases, anything like that? Yeah, so I'm not sure um, whether the specifically the same techniques that uh, David was using, but there have been. Um, oh, just let me think. I'm trying to think. There's been studies on isotopes, and um, I think it might be nitrogen isotopes. I'd have to double check, but. Um, Essentially, yeah, you do see similar. So they respond to hydrology and or hydrological conditions, and they do track quite well with uh, these transfer function reconstructions. Um, but that's that's kind of why I, I mentioned about when you're testing these transfer functions, it's really good. It's not common practice, but it's really good if you have some real world um, water table depth measurements that you can actually test your transfer function against but obviously that's a lot more intensive um, and it's not like an industry standard so that's uh, that's where things need to go maybe but um, so, so yeah to answer your question yes but 
I don't, I can't remember the, the details off the top of my head. Got it, got it, yeah. And I just had a, a quick follow up as well. So you're using, <clears throat> um, using a mean analog, sorry, <clears throat> modern analog uh, math yes. to do a lot of the, the quantitative reconstruction work. Um, I, I, with a, a friend of mine, a colleague, uh, Manuel Chevalier, we've developed a software around an indicator method approach. So, you know, looking more at the specific affinities of each individual type and then combining those PDFs for their, their niches and getting sort of yeah. optimum values. Um, we do that because there aren't any modern assemblages that we can use for, for Matt. Um, but we've, all, we've found it to be um, really powerful um, and also interesting where we can compare them. And I was wondering if you've used anything besides Matt for reconstructions at all, or is it just, it works quite well, so you just kind of go with that? So it, do, it does seem to work quite well, so we haven't used that approach. But what would be interesting is, I mean, if you did both and compared the two, so that could be interesting beyond just peatlands and test data amoeba. So you could say it might be useful to you and your colleagues then if, if hmm. it works for this peatland ecosystem and test data amoeba, maybe it just adds weight to the method you're using when there isn't a modern analog. Um, so it could be something really useful to do, but it's not, uh, it's not the approach that we're taking. No. Particularly for study. <clears throat> so I, need, I'm need a master's student on it. Yeah, yeah. We, we are doing some work on uh, subarctic peatlands, looking at their westerly reconstructions, and we are not using transfer functions because we find there is no sufficient um, diversity of species. Uh, so that would be a really sort of neat place to try no. it as well. But what we use is actually biomass because we're trying to detect changes in salinity rather than water table. Right. Uh, and the biomass goes right down when it's salty. So um, we are using that instead, but it would be really neat to try other methods actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, for, you know, where we work, it's just kind of like kind of throw the kitchen sink at it and see what, what sticks. And, uh, and if there isn't anything, then kind of try to build something. Um, but yeah, no, no, for sure. Well, it, again, if ever you're interested, just you know, contact me and we'll uh, can see what we can set up. My name's the man. Yeah. Really, but I can play. You should uh, put your, uh, your email, Brian, on the on the chat. I will. Perhaps. I'll put it on because I keep saying email me and then. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Cool. Great Thank talk. You. Really liked it. Yeah. Thanks, Brian. Um, I'm just checking if there are any questions in um, in YouTube, but I don't think there are any. May I ask one question, Angela? Please, go ahead. Yeah, I don't know if you have mentioned it already or whether I missed it. Uh, do we have this test of amoeba also in tropical region that we found or only in the uh, like very cold region that you have mentioned? Do we have them in tropical region also? Yeah, so um, yeah, test amoeba. So my talk, yeah, focus bias to kind of northern, northern hemisphere and the Arctic, but test amoeba are found globally. So I know that people from Exeter, maybe even well, Angela herself as well, has worked on peatlands in the Southern Hemisphere, tropical peatlands. Um, so that there are transfer functions for water table depth in the tropics as well. Um, so that it's it's global essentially. It's the, the methodology and the species. The methodology will be the same, but the species will be different. Yeah. Right. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. I don't know if, I mean, it's not really a question, but I just wondered, Tom, if you might um, talk a little bit more about what you think are the main limitations. So somebody asked, I think of, of the talk that David um, David gave, but, you know, people were asking about, you know, how accurate is the proxy? And, and you know, I, I just wondered if you might uh give a little bit more you know more detail about that that part of it so yeah you know what what do you think are the main limitations of the application of this so um can I, I sort of alluded to this a little bit when i was talking about um the interpretation of the the proxy so we go out and we we measure it over a, a period of a few days that have similar conditions um well, that's how you get your environmental variables um, so the, the amoeba, the generation time, you might have uh, a few to maybe 10 generations of amoeba a season, I think, um, can change. But 
So that means that they respond quite quickly to changes in the environment. So you can be quite confident that they rep represent the conditions that you're measuring. Um, obviously, factors will affect that, but you can be quite confident. Um, so kind of moving on from that, uh, you know that only living amoeba are living at the surface. And um, when you get to a certain point, they're limited by light and oxygen supply. So the further down you get, in the core isn't contaminated by living amoeba, if that makes sense. So uh, you have a good separation between living and fossilized, um, which is useful in the reconstruction. There's no contamination. Um, there may be a little bit, but uh, at the surface, but as you go further down, you increase your confidence on that. Um, and then that the, the reason you measure, if you measure water table depth in the field, that's going to be in centimeters, but like I said, it's only measured over a few days. So if you try and apply that as a seasonal average, for example, it's kind of misleading. So that's why you, use, you, kind of, you can get around that, or not get around that, but just take that into consideration and use Z scores, um, which, uh, which means that you're not reconstructing an actual value, but you get a directional shift. And that's kind of, that's perhaps more useful as well, because um, if you're getting, a directional shift across a number of peatlands, then you can you can have greater confidence in that, um, and that and, and so greater confidence in your reconstructions. Um, so yeah, I, I think you you can be confident uh, in the directional shift, but not necessarily a specific value. Um, so it, you need to take that into account when you're interpreting the data. And the same way that David was saying the, the GDGTs uh, max out at a certain temperature, do you think that uh, tested amoeba also have a specific range and you can't go, you know, if it gets much wet or much drier, the proxy may not be as sensitive? Um, I mean, perhaps, yeah. So that kind of on what we were discussing before, you, if you've got modern analog, you're assuming that the condition, the range of conditions we have now is within the range of conditions that have occurred in the past. So if, for example, hypothetically, there were it's the peatlands in Svalbard had been extremely wet, they had a water table depth of minus 20, you know, saturated by water in the past, our transfer function wouldn't capture that because we haven't captured that in our um, modern analog. Uh, but I think you can be re just from understanding of peatland ecosystems, the the usual range of water table depth values will be minus five to maybe 35. So you can see in our data set, we basically have that. So we can be pretty confident that the test state amoeba will, rep that that environment now will encompass the limitations of past environments. Um, but um, it, because, because the main, Thing that test state amoeba are sensitive to is moisture. If it was temperature, then perhaps we wouldn't be able to have a good modern analog. So, because the temperature has increased by four degrees over the last century, that we now only have a modern analog that's four degrees warmer than 100 years ago. That isn't likely to be the main driver of test state amoeba in this case. Um, so, if it was, we, we would have to perhaps use some of the, the methods that Brian's used um, that aren't, don't rely on the modern analog. Uh, but in terms of water table depth and also electrical conductivity, so um, linked to the trophic states of the peatlands, that is that is likely to be captured by our modern analog. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you, Tom. There is two two messages from Ruby. Um, she says, uh, "Great talk, thank you." And she's wondering whether you found that freezes impacted the tested assemblages, and if so. Did it affect the reliability of your water table depth reconstruction? Um, so we, where, where we sampled, uh, we sampled from the active layer. So these patterns are underlaid by underlaid by permafrost, um, but we're sampling the unfrozen part of them during the summer. Um, so over the winter, the entire peat column will be frozen. The peat will go be dormant. Uh, sorry, the test amoeba will be dormant. Um, and only um, kind of become uh, active when they th when we get this active layer in the summer. So um, I think 
yes, we, our, our water table re reconstructions are only for the summer months where there is no, uh, there is where the peak column isn't completely frozen. Um, but these amoeba are able to be be frozen seasonally, survive, go dormant, and then become active again in the summer. Um, so I hope that answers your question somewhat. Let me see. I just check the chat again. I don't Thanks. know if we. No, she hasn't said anything. But I think that that more or less answers. I'll I'll tell you if Ruby posts anything else. And then the other question from her also is. Is it common practice to use a trait-based transfer function for tested amoeba, or is it more usual to use a species-based one? Uh, so, yeah, so I've, I've used, I think it's more usual to use a species-based one, but uh, so that in that sense, there was, I had that slide where there was the water table depth optima of certain species, um, but there is some work being done on traits. So that could be to do with, something about like so it could be due to the size of certain species or this the the size of the aperture uh, maybe the color so those things within a certain species may be able to give you increased detail um so for the, for the work i'm doing we're not doing that but you may be able to get increased detail from your transfer function if you take into account um uh, trait based uh, features yes I hope that has answered uh, Ruby's questions. If not, Ruby, maybe you can post another question in the chat. Yeah, or feel free to, to email me. I'll, I'll post my email in the chat after this. Oh, thank you. Thank you. That's great. Are there any other questions either in Zoom or? I don't think so. Linda, do you have any other questions? No, I don't see any other questions. So shall we go forward to the next session? Or are we? Uh, we're a little bit early. Uh, so if there are no questions, we may just uh, have another break for 10 minutes. People can check their emails or whatever they need to do for 10 minutes. Uh, so at 12.30 UK, sorry, I don't know what time it is in India. Um, uh, yeah, it's about six o'clock now. About eight minutes to go. Eight minutes to go. Uh, if probably as we are clearly, should we go for the next speaker so that we may? Um, the only problem is people that are joining for specific talks oh, uh, yeah, may may miss yeah. miss the start in that case. Yeah, yeah. yeah we'll um, wait. I think maybe. Yeah, we need to maybe. Um, Ruby has just answered Tom that uh, she uh, f found the answers very useful. Thank you. Okay, great. So I think a little break. Yeah, sorry, we we wanted to have a little bit of flexibility. So if we had any problems or anything like that, we could resolve them. Uh, but it's going really well, so we have a little bit of flexibility. So seven minutes now, and we'll start with our next talk. Thank you, Tom. That was amazing. Thank you very, very much. Cheers.
Hello, Rabiul. Are you online? Yeah. Let me see you. Thank you. Hi. Hi, Rabiul. Hi. Uh, Angela, your mic is mute. Sorry, just saying hi, Rabiul. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Are we ready to go? It's fine. Okay, so we have today next speaker, Dr. Rabiul Bishwas from Institute of Earth Science and Dynamics, University of Lucerne, Switzerland. Uh, he will be talking about LGM temperature in the Alps, quantified using luminescence paleothermometry. To say a few words about Rabiul, he has completed his PhD from Physical Research Laboratory, Ahmedabad, India. And after that, he has uh, worked as a JSPS postdoctoral fellow at Okayama University of Science, Japan. Now he is working as a premier research assistant at Lu University of Lucerne, Switzerland. So over to you, Rabiul. Thanks, Linto. Share that. Can you see the slides? Yes. Okay. Uh, thanks to the organizing committee and particularly Linto uh, for organizing this uh, lecture series and inviting me and giving me the opportunity to present my work here. So I will talk about the estimation of uh, temperature in the last glacial maxima in the uh, European Alps, and that would be quantified using uh, luminescence paleothermometry. So the last glacial maxima lasted about uh, uh, 33 kilo year to 17 kilo years ago and correspond to the largest and probably best documented uh, climate change in the recent Earth history. And uh, so during LGM, the climate was probably the, uh, globally, it was drier and cooler and the cooling led to the expansion of polar ice sheets and the ice caps at a high uh, latitude and uh, and on sufficiently high mountain range, the actual temperature during uh, the LGM remain, uh, however, uh, uncertain. So this is uh, the extension of ice sheet in the uh, European Alps uh, during uh, last glacial maxima. So there are several proxies uh, to determine the past temperature. Uh, some are direct proxy and some are indirect proxies like uh, isotope in uh, marine core or uh, ice records, and then fossil pollen, um, carbonate speleothrum, and the uh, 3 helium and 21 uh, noble gas based uh, paleothermometry. However, all this method has uh, a limitation, uh, especially uh, methodological limitation, either or uh, they say there is an absence of uh, this record. For example, the fossil pollen, it records the millennial time scale uh, temperature record. However, that it shows uh, some, uh, there's a, it has uh, depends on the many parameters, uh, like uh, including uh, precipitation, uh, and there's the plant available moisture, there's a length of growing season, and then uh, seasonality, everything. And so that limits the use of uh, this uh, uh, regular use of this uh, proxy. And for example, this, uh, uh, this is uh, the global uh, sediment record for last 200 kilo year, uh, and Delta Etino record. And this is uh, ice core record uh, from in, uh, uh, NGRIP data, uh, North uh, Greenland uh, ice core project. So you can see this uh, since LGM, there is an increase of temperature, but whether the, there's a direct uh, translation of Delta Etino into temperature is not uh, very straight away. And so there is a compilation of uh, the uh, a Delta Etino record uh, in European Alps. Uh, however, you can see there is, a, there is no continuous record. Uh, there is a, uh, in the missing, the most, but mostly uh, the uh, Delta Etino record in European Alps follow uh, the Greenland ice core record. So, here I will talk about the new uh, 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 proxy, which is the thermal luminescence of feldspar. 
So this uh, work is recently published. So I will mostly cover uh, this paper and I'll talk about the methodology as well as the, its implications. Natural uh, minerals like quartz and uh, feldspar has uh, the crystals which are not uh, completely perfect, which has the impurity or defect center. And those impurity and defect center can act like an electron or hole trapping center, uh, depends on its charge environment. And the, the surrounding environments and positively uh, uh, charged, then it can trap as an electron or, or vice versa. So when the minerals are exposed to natural radiation like uranium, uh, like uh, alpha, beta, gamma radiation that emits from uh, uranium, thorium, and potassium, the atoms gets ionized and electron hole pair generated and electron can get trapped at the trapping center. And the resident time of the trapped electron can vary from less than a year to up to billion year. So those trapped electrons will be unparted until unless we bring them in the laboratory and uh, heat the samples with some linear heating rate slowly. So when we heat the samples from the shallower trap, which has a lesser lifetime or the lower energy, the trapped electron will emit fast and then the deeper trap, and that will provide a composite glow curve. And the number of peaks denotes the number of electron uh, energy levels. However, in case of feldspar, we see a very broad spectrum of TL glow curve. There is no continuous, there's no, uh, no finite number of peaks. And if you see the energy level, it is not a discrete, rather it is a continuous energy level. So the thermal luminescence signal associated with uh, this kind of uh, tra uh, trap is uh, very sensitive to temperature and these are extremely insensitive to temperature. So this, signals normally used, which is uh, very highly sensitive, uh, highly insensitive to temperature for the dating application, however, uh, which is more sensitive to temperature can act like a, either thermochronology application or uh, the surface paleothermometry. So the shallower trap, which is around 200 degrees centigrade is sensitive to surface temperature fluctuation. So this is the resident time of the trapped electron that can vary, as I said, that is less than a year to up to billion year old. So this dating range that is around 300 to 400 degrees centigrade, this signal is commonly used for dating application. And because this signal is insensitive to any kind of surface temperature fluctuation or any kind of heating event or extremely stable signal and some media, uh, intermediate signal, which is uh, comparatively inset, insensitive to uh, surface temperature fluctuation, uh, but that's a, the geothermal, uh, that has a um, uh, effect on the, when the rock passes through geothermal gradient, those used as a thermochronology application, and even the shallower traps, which are sensitive to uh, typical surface temperature fluctuation of the order of 10, 20 degrees centigrade. So the rock mineral, which is uh, exposed to uh, radiation for million year time scale, the luminescence signals in is in equilibrium level. And the equilibrium level is decided by the radiation induced growth, uh, which increases the signal. And there is a thermal decay and a thermal decay. So there is a three uh, 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 process involved. So if the temperature is more, the thermal rate of thermal decay is more. And this athermal decay is the quantum mechanical tunneling. If the trapped electron is very close to recombination center or other center, the signal may um, say, uh, leak through the uh, system and that reduce the luminescence signal. However, this can be quantified in the laboratory. So if you know this, and if you know the growth rate, we will know the effect of uh, thermal effect uh, on the signals. So this is more like a leaky beaker, which has a, that is a, you are feeling the uh, beaker as well, as well as there is a leaking through thermal leak and a thermal leak. And if you know the thermal, a thermal leak, then we can quantify the, uh, how the uh, thermal, uh, quantify the thermal leak. So in a mathematical formulation, that is a, there's a rate of, uh, there's, a, uh, there's a rate equation of trap charge population which has a three factor. One is the growth due to ambient radioactivity, uranium, thorium, potassium emitted alpha, beta, and gamma radiation. 
which denotes the dose rate, environmental dose rate. D0 is, they say, it has a finite number of traps, so it will reach to saturation. So how quickly it uh, reach to saturate level? This is, the thermal, this is the thermal loss term, which has three uh, terms. One is uh, the uh, frequency factor, the lattice vibration frequency, and the activation energy, how much energy it need to escape from the crystal lattice. And, uh, and the thermal loss has a, there's a, there's a row prime, which is like a rate of fading. So we need to quantify in the laboratory these uh, parameters, so particularly this dose rate, environmental dose rate, D0, how quickly it uh, reached to the saturation level, then a thermal frequency factor, uh, trap depth, a thermal frequency factor, and the a thermal fading rate. So this model was validated to uh, KTB borehole sample, which is an extremely nice archive that has a the temperature is quite known and there is no exhumation the rock is sitting at a particular temperature for millions of, uh, of years. So we collected samples uh, from a different uh, depth, uh, from a uh, surface to up to two kilometer uh, depth, and we analyzed and we found uh, the predicted the temperature uh, and this uh, white box is the uh, expected temperature and the colored plot is uh, in the uh, predicted temperature. So this is uh, quite well, and you can see there is an increasing of temperature as we go from the uh, deep interior to uh, towards surface. So we are quite happy with this, and we implemented this model for the surface paleothermometry application. So as I said before, so we need to uh, constrain the uh, parameters. So one is the growth parameters. So for that, if we solve this equation, this will give an equation like a saturation exponential kind of thing. So if it's uh, in the laboratory, uh, we do the three separate experiments, uh, which is the, how the growth in uh, laboratory and the, how the thermal loss and a thermal loss. So for the growth, the, the, the signal is growing in that fashion. And if we feed this equation, uh, uh, feed this uh, data point with this equation, we get that uh, thermal uh, the growth parameters like uh, D0 and A. And the, as I said that, that is a, if you solve this equation, there's a second equation, which is uh, thermal loss. Uh, we will get a, a glow curve equation that we, uh, which has a single uh, energy level, and that will give a very single, very narrow peak. However, in laboratory, the, in nature, that will get a broad peak. So broad peak is actually sum of large number of this single peak. So that uh, we uh, uh, deconvolute and uh, calculate uh, the uh, parameters at each uh, uh, point of the glow curve. So for this, that is how we do the uh, fractional heating method, which is called uh, the TMT stop method. We sequentially, uh, uh, this they remove the trapped electron and then measure the uh, luminescence glow curve. So as we increase the, uh, in, let's say, preheating temperature, the TL peak shift to higher temperature. And from any TL glow curve, that's a, which is called fractional glow curve, if we subtract two consecutive glow curve, it will give a small peak, uh, which, is, which we can be assumed as a single peak. And that we fitted with the previously shown equation then we'll get a, there's a uh, many number of sub peaks that are fitted uh, with that equation and we get uh, the activation energy uh, frequency factor and the, uh, the order parameter. So these are the distribution of these kinetic parameters along the TL glow curve. So you can see this is actually the low energy and this is high energy. So this activation energy is a highly sensitive parameter uh, for this kind of application. And finally, we uh, this, uh, constrain the thermal decay parameter. In laboratory, if we store the samples for different uh, time, uh, it follow a logarithmic decay. And if you solve this equation and feed this curve, we constrain the row prime uh, parameter. So finally, the, our aim is to constrain all this uh, parameter, which is uh, uh, noted in, uh, in the rate, uh, uh, and to see the distribution, how they are distributed along the TL glow curve, and we could uh, uh, estimate that. 
Now, as I said, that is, it has a continuous distribution, but when we talk about the thermometer or any kind of uh, there's a temperature sensitive, we need to discretize it. So we, if we, there's a 10 degree centigrade interval, it, so each that 10 degree centigrade uh, temperature window can act like a uh, different thermometer. So this is highly sensitive to temperature. This is lesser sensitive to temperature. So this is low temperature thermometer. This is a high temperature thermometer. Now let's see that's a, how these different thermometers uh, uh, behave in a, that's a different thermal field. So we choose uh, three different uh, uh, time temperature field. One is the constant, and this is uh, started from a one million year. And this one is temp uh, since the last hundred kilo year, the temperature is uh, decreasing and the temperature is increasing. So as I said before, there's, if the temperature is constant, that lumi equilibrium luminescence level will be always uh, there's a, uh, a constant for different thermometer. And the shallower, uh, low temperature thermometer will have a, uh, there's a lower trapped electron concentration because it is less sensitive to, uh, uh, high sensitive to temperature. And this is uh, uh, now, if the temperature decreases, the equilibrium luminescence level increases. And the vice versa, if the temperature increases, the equilibrium luminescence level decreases. So this shows that is a present day trap charge population or the luminescence uh, 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 level, which is uh, sensitive to temperature, how it uh, vary uh, in nature. Now, since I said that is a, they are uh, in a, uh, sensitive to different level to temperature, so let's see that is a, how they are, uh, how long they are sensitive to uh, that, that kind of temperature. There's a time range. So it is expected that the lower temperature will have, uh, will give a information for a shorter time and the deeper trap will give a, uh, there's a higher time. So to quantify that, we prescribe the step function like a uh, temperature field so, so there is a T chain. So if the T chain increases, the luminescence level increases. So now there's a, you can see there's a lower trap is a, can remember for, for see this example, lower trap remembers suppose up to uh, 200 degree centigrade TL signal, which is the lower temperature thermometer can remember only the five uh, kilo year thermal history and the deeper trap, which is like a 250 degree centigrade, which remember comparatively a longer time. But the higher temperature thermometer, which is more than 250 degree centigrade is insensitive to this kind of, uh, so it can't remember uh, when the temperature change happened. But if, if the temperature changes more, like a, there's a, uh, by, uh, instead of 30 degree centigrade here, if the temperature changes 100 degree, then these higher temperature traps will be uh, sensitive. So this depends on the what kind of temperature uh, fluctuation happens in nature. So however in nature, which is mostly uh, uh, the luminescence, uh, 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 nature, the temperature follow the oscillating thermal field. So we prescribed a simple uh, sinusoidal oscillation, uh, uh, like a periodic oscillation with a different uh, mean temperature, amplitude, and the period. And you can see this is uh, the driving force and uh, temperature force, and this is how the luminescence profile changes. So the present day luminescence for different traps are different. So these dotted lines are if the samples are kept at constant temperature of the, uh, which is the mean of this uh, oscillating thermal field. So you can see there is a uh, phase lag between this uh, 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 constant temperature or oscillating temperature. And this lag is different for a different uh, thermometer. So this can be exploited uh, for that uh, paleo temperature uh, reconstruction as they behave differently uh, they are differently sensitive to temperature and time. So they should be uh, ab able to construct the uh, let's say past temperature uh, changes. However, there's a, uh, to see there's a how actually for, with this different parameter, if you talk in terms of the period, the resident time of that or the lifetime of the trapped electron corresponded to 200 to 300 degrees centigrade, the lowermost to higher most. Uh, 
uh, at zero degree centigrade, lifetime varies 10 kilo year to 1 billion year. But when the samples are kept at 30 degrees centigrade, the lifetime decreases drastically, which is uh, 0 0.1 kilo year to up to 1 million year. So it depends on the what kind of temperature that we are measuring. So see the scenario when P is very less than, uh, um, much less than the tau in the lifetime, suppose zero degrees centigrade. Uh, if the uh, periods is here, the period is uh, one kilo year only. So you can see very small ripple and the small ripple is uh, lower than the mean temperature uh, value. So that means that uh, when this P is very, very less than tau, it act like an isotherm, which is a higher temperature isotherm. And, the, and the, another extreme scenario, when P is very, very less than tau, and the like period here, it is 100 kilo year. So we can see there's a, there's a uh, suppose see the signals, which has a very low lifetime, so you cannot distinguish whether the samples kept at constant temperature, which is dotted line, or it is a, it follows the periodic temperature. So the present day luminescence is indistinguishable from the constant uh, isothermal temperature or the periodic mean temperature. However, when the P is very comparable to tau, the lifetime is uh, of the order of the period of the uh, thermal force uh, around like a 10 kilo year, you can see this kind of scenario and uh, as I said before, that they have a different kind of uh, lag between the driving force and the trapped response to the trapped child's population. And this uh, lag is different for uh, different thermometers. So this kind of scenario we can use for to reconstruct the paleo temperature. Now to see this, uh, how uh, this uh, uh, method is sensitive to different parameter like a mean temperature, amplitude of oscillation and the period. So we can see that is if the mean amplitude and the periods are kept constant and the mean temperature is varied, you can see it is highly sensitive to the uh, mean temperature and comparatively less sensitive to uh, the uh, amplitude and the period of oscillation. However, the pattern is quite unique. So for a unique periodic oscillation, there is a unique trend of luminescence. That is the whole point. So to see this, uh, how this method work uh, 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 precisely, they said we, do, we did the synthetic test. Uh, in, so in the first approach, uh, we prescribed three uh, periodic path, which has a different mean temperature uh, and amplitude, but the period is same. And we predict the present day luminescence using this, uh, uh, this uh, uh, equation, uh, what will be the present day luminescence uh, we uh, constrain it. Then we do the inverse modeling. So in the inverse modeling, we first generate a large number of random paths, which is like 300,000, and uh, which is a periodic path. And those uh, mean temperature is randomly varied, uh, this uh, mean temperature, and the amplitude also randomly varied from zero to 40 degrees centigrade. And the P are varied randomly, but between uh, they say, uh, 25, 41, and 100 kilo year. The reason that we did, uh, uh, because this, as I mentioned before, that this method cannot distinguish very close period, like a 10, it cannot differentiate 10 kilo year and 15 kilo year probably. So we know that there are three important cycles in nature, Milankovitch cycles, that is 25, 41, and 100 kilo year. So we, we vary it randomly, but uh, in a constrained manner. And then for each path, we predict the present day luminescence and the best paths were selected using uh, the misfit data, like a misfit is, then we compare the uh, observed value, which is observed using the forward modeling. And, uh, this, uh, uh, and this is the predicted for each path. Then, and this is, so lowest misfit is the best path and the highest misfit is the worst path. And then we uh, calculate the likelihood. And finally, we, uh, they say uh, uh, in a, that uh, time temperature field, uh, we uh, generate a, a box and there's a different array and uh, generate a probability density plot. So these are the result of the inverse modeling. So here the uh, periods are completely 
mean temperature amplitude and the periods are completely random so the dotted red line is the actual path and this uh, this solid red line is the predicted median and this is white and black lines are one sigma and two sigma confidence interval so you can see that so really we cannot uh, constrain this periodic path if we make uh, mean temperature amplitude and period all three are complete random however if we fix the period and change the mean temperature and the amplitude of oscillation we can constrain the uh, prescribed path very quite accurately so here uh, one thing is clear that so we need a prior information of period uh, then we can constrain the mean temperature and the amplitude and the best way to do is that is said uh, to take the greenland i square record which has uh, the delta eteno record and this is proportional to temperature and it has the all periodic cycles like uh, milankovitch cycles 25 40 and 100 kilo year cycles are uh, involved so for this uh, synthetic approach what we do this of uh, the forward modeling first we uh, define a thermal history uh, three different uh, path and that follow the greenland i score uh, record then uh, we do that uh, inverse mo uh, inverse modeling for uh, 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 this uh, method and the for the inverse modeling we use the same uh, delta eteno record but scale them differently so we uh, they say this is the base temperature which is uh, there's a lgm temperature and this is present so we different uh, change the uh, difference between uh, lgm and present day so we stretch the whole profile and the whole profile is uh, there's a swinging up and down that means the mean temperature is also uh, changing so we can generate a large number of random path which has a different amplitude and the different mean temperature and as i said before the, through that misfit for each path uh, we predict the present day luminescence and compared with the observed value and then we calculate the misfit and the likelihood and then probability density function and you can see that so we can uh, so using those delta eteno record we can quite precisely uh, uh, there's a uh, 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 reconstruct this three time temperature history which has a different uh, amplitude and different uh, mean temperature so we know that is uh, so we if we have a prior information of period then we can uh, constrain the temperature uh, uh, like uh, mean temperature and the amplitude of uh, uh, the difference so this uh, we applied to um, uh, mamblo massif uh, so we took uh, Marde, uh, samples from the uh, marde glass uh there's a mamblo massif and uh, samples were taken from uh, 500 meter glacier valley uh, uh, there's a uh, deep uh, at different altitude around 200 uh, 2000 to 2500 meter altitude and uh, then what we did there so we measured the luminescence of different thermometer uh, in the laboratory and then we did the inverse modeling as i mentioned before using delta eteno record so in this whole approach the main assumption is the the temperature changes in european alps follow the greenland ice core record and which is true because there is a many lake sediment uh, around uh, austria and uh, switzerland and they showed that uh, uh, the temp uh, delta eteno record follow the greenland ice core record so this uh, ice core record has a all uh, temperature forcing like all milankovitch cycles and inverse modeling was done for 300000 uh, paths uh, uh, to constrain the uh, uh, pre uh, there's a uh, past temperature and you can see this is uh, this is the temperature profile of five samples so that were collected in the, uh, from mamblo massif these are the temperature profile and these are the temperature at uh, lgm uh, and this is temperature at present so the difference between the present and uh, so this is this is the temperature change and uh, we we calculate the temperature change or temperature offset from lgm and today 
So, however, you can see one thing that uh, they said the present day temperature in uh, Alps is around, uh, we predict it around five, uh, five to six degrees centigrade. And the samples were taken from around 2,500 meter altitude and uh, the atmospheric temperature in that region should be close to zero degrees centigrade. So there is an offset between the atmospheric temperature and the rock temperature. So remember here, here we measure the rock surface temperature, not the atmospheric temperature, the variation in uh, rock surface temperature. So there is a recent study that uh, which shows that rock is always hotter than the air. And uh, so this, uh, uh, this uh, Magnin et al. in 2019, that did uh, uh, celebrate the permafrost uh, distribution in Alps. And how the uh, atmospheric temperature uh, and the rock temperature are uh, different. Uh, they estimated that. And they found the rock temperature is always uh, four to five degrees centigrade higher than the uh, atmospheric temperature. However, they didn't include, uh, uh, they said there's a different type of rock property or they have a different kind of uh, black body radiation. Uh, but though it is uh, always uh, the, uh, rock is always uh, hotter than the air. And another thing, it depends on the, this, the orientation, which are included in their model. Like uh, if the rock is uh, there's a north facing, it should be colder. And if the south facing, it should be hotter. And there is a, another factor, which is the seasonal fluctuation. As I mentioned before, if the period is less, which is less than uh, one kilo year period, so the, uh, the Oscillating thermal field act like a, uh, there's a higher temperature isotherm that I mentioned before. And we did this uh, they said, uh, in the uh, Shamoni area, which is uh, near to Europe, uh, 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 Mamla Massif, uh, closest station, where temperature fluctuate from winter to summer is, uh, they said, plus minus 10 degrees centigrade. So if this kind of seasonal fluctuation is there, it will predict the equivalent uh, temperature, which is two, three degrees centigrade higher than the mean temperature. So this, uh, so present day temperature, which is higher than the atmospheric temperature could be due to two reasons. One is the uh, rock temperature is higher and another is the seasonal fluctuation, uh, fluctuation. But the whole profile is actually for the rock, which is exposed uh, since LGM. So this profile is uh, valid for the uh, rock temperature. Now, if we just, uh, see the temperature offset, which is uh, temperature, this is uh, the temperature profile during LGN, and this is uh, temperature profile uh, during uh, uh, present uh, today. And this is the uh, black circles are the model temperature, uh, which is uh, based on the orientation of the rock and the uh, solar, uh, solar radiation. And this is the predicted temperature, which is uh, quite good but this offset could be that seasonal fluctuation that I mentioned before. And if you see the offset between the LGM and present uh, is uh, that is uh, my, uh, uh, around nine degrees centigrade. So this was implemented uh, to uh, this. Uh, so we combined this TL paleothermometry study and the inversion of glacier ice extent into climate variable, which is one of our colleagues uh, did in his PhD thesis. They are, so this is the extension of LGM, uh, the, the ice extension during LGM. And then uh, what he did, uh, this uh, glacier ice flow modeling and the predict uh, this, uh, what could be the combination of time, temp uh, time and the moisture condition. So they found a range of solution and that uh, different uh, uh, combination of solution. So either the, uh, he could constrain the uh, uh, past uh, LGM ice extent, uh, either the temperature offset is high and the climatic condition was very dry or the temperature offset is low and, uh, and the uh, precipitation is quite high. So this kind of combination and so this x-axis is the uh, precipitation. This is uh, present day uh, precipitation. So this is uh, the uh, temperature offset that we measured using uh, uh, luminescence uh, paleothermometry. And we can predict uh, through that, that, uh, that during LGM, 
uh, the weather was almost uh, uh, 50 to 85 degrees centigrade, uh, 85 uh, percent drier than the present. So based on this uh, study, we uh, summarized that a new uh, TL-based paleothermometry has been developed. So this is an independent method and, uh, and direct method, which is that directly laboratory measurement is enough. But only thing is that we need to know prior information of that's a pattern of temperature change. And then we uh, scale it uh, here uh, in the European Alps, uh, we consider that is a uh, 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 Greenland ice core record. And the LGM in the Alps was around uh, nine degrees centigrade colder than the present. And in that area, the fossil pollen study, it suggests that around 12 plus minus three degrees centigrade uh, temperature offset between LGM and present. And LGM in the Alps was more likely between uh, 50 to 85% drier than the present. And uh, independent uh, ice extent uh, reconstruction that assumed the precipitation pattern uh, at the LGM were identical uh, to present, but the climate was around 50% drier and they could construct uh, the LGM uh, 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 ice, con uh, ice record. Yeah, that's all. Thank you. Thank you, Rabir, for a very wonderful talk. Do we have any questions? I don't see any in the chat box. If any of the uh, participants have any questions, you may ask now. Okay, if uh, no one has any question, uh, Rabir, may I ask, like, how do the geological past change the, uh, the te temperature record? Uh, do, we, do we have any influence of uh, the tectonics that plays a role in the paleothermometry of that area? Yeah, that will change. Uh, if there is a tectonic activity area, uh, then uh, it will depend on the, the like, kind of exhumation. So this kind of study is only uh, they say applicable to a region where tectonic activity is less, yes, okay. or any uh, kind of uh, they say any phenomena which has uh, the temperature influence, like any kind of hot spring or any kind of forest fire, or any kind of rock exhumation. Uh, this cannot be applied to that region. The, this Alps area that you have studied, uh, do we have any effect on that? Now, Alps has a very low uh, they say, uh, they say activity, and um, it is almost uh, stationary. And the, that area is, uh, and since LGM, there is no, even the erosion uh, in that region is very, uh, quite uh, very low, which is uh, around 10 to the power minus three to four millimeter, uh, minus three millimeter per year. Okay, that's nice, thank you. Any other questions? Shall I stop sharing my screen? Uh, yeah, one more question may I ask? I don't know if I get it correctly. Like you said this low temperature uh, that is uh, like uh, about 200 degrees centigrade that was sensitive for about five kilo a year for lower, temperature, lower time yeah. range. And yes. for higher temperature about 300 degrees Celsius it is for older you know, records. Around uh, 50 kilo a year. 40 kilo a year, yeah, yeah, something like that you said mentioned. How this, uh, like uh, the temperature or with increasing temperature, how it get more sensitized towards the age? Yes, uh, that, is, that is for sure. That uh, if the temperature uh, changes very high, so there I mentioned, if you see this and uh, that slides, let me go. So there, you see this, uh, here the step function is 10 degree, 20 degree and 30 degree centigrade. So for that kind of scenario, uh, it is that. But if the temperature changes is much higher, uh, you can, there's a more, uh, there's a higher temperature thermometer you can include and you can probably go for longer time. Okay, thank you. Did I answer you correct? Uh, yeah, I, I think I got it, yes, thank you. Any other questions? We have got about 10 more minutes, isn't it? Angela? 
Yes, 10 more minutes until we have our next talk. So if anybody wants to ask any questions, I'm checking the YouTube chat and there is none there. Uh, Rebul, if you want to uh, explain some of the limitations or it's uh, this proxy is in the uh, juvenile stage. So if you want to give some caution while using this, you may explain. Them. Yeah, so there are uh, some limitation in the method, uh, like uh, uh, the luminescence method is you heat the samples in the very beginning up to uh, 450 degrees centigrade. So which that is a heating the samples or any crystal, which is the feldspar mineral. So if, in some feldspar, if we heat the sample up to 450 degrees centigrade, it characteristics changes. Like its sensitivity, uh, sensitivity, the luminescence production efficiency, uh, which changes drastically. So if the changes is very drastic, either we have to monitor that precisely, or that will be the uh, biggest uh, challenge in this method. So some samples behave quite weird that uh, the sensitivity change is very high. So we try to monitor that sensitivity change. And if you are wrong in that, we will be estimate a wrong temperature. So that is uh, one big thing uh, in the using thermoluminescence method. And this method that is so normally this uh, thermochronology application and the paleothermometry study, TL is more lucrative because TL has a thermoluminescence as a different energy levels, which is uh, from uh, a very, uh, uh, very high sensitive uh, to temperature to uh, least sensitive to temperature uh, compared to OSL, which is a fixed energy levels. So TL has a flexibility of using multiple thermometer and from very low to high temperature thermometer. So that is lucrative from the, but the, from the measurement point of view or the measurement accuracy point of view, TL is not superior method than the OSL. So that is the compromise. So we have to be very, uh, uh, take uh, quite precaution uh, when we are uh, measuring the TL signal. We have to monitor the sensitivity change uh, quite nicely. That is one thing. Another limitation is that, as I mentioned before, for the inverse modeling, we cannot uh, there's a, uh, make everything complete random, like uh, amplitude period and the mean temperature. So we need a prior information of the period or any kind of there's a pattern of the temperature changes. And the best way to get is uh, there's a delta eternal record. Mm -hmm. So in, if any area has a nice delta eternal record, we can take that spectrum and then scale it to temp temperature very easily uh, using this method. And the third thing is that is a, uh, in this inverse modeling uh, they said that we do, that say it has a different parameter, as I said, that's like a 10 to uh, 12 parameter. And each parameter has uncertainty. So in our inverse modeling, rather than picking the, the mean value of that uh, mean uh, parameters, uh, we give complete flexibility to that uh, uh, parameter within error range. So, so that is the reason we run this model for a large number of paths, around 300,000 uh, paths. Okay, and you can see this is um, the uh, uncertainty is uh, quite high. So, if you see the predicted temperature, um, sorry. So the predicted temperature, the red color is the median and the white is the one sigma confidence interval and the black is the two sigma confidence interval. So it has a quite high uncertainty. And uh, that, so you can see this is the, if you take a one single sample, it has an uncertainty around plus minus five degrees centigrade. So eight plus Excuse minus me. five degrees centigrade. Although we take, uh, took the samples from the similar region and they have identical things. So, so the weighted average is uh, around nine degrees centigrade plus minus two degrees centigrade. So it has a uncertainty is quite high. So that uh, reduction of uncertainty is not uh, quite straight or easy. So these are the, an, another limitation. 
uh, Rapil, one more thing I wanted to make it clear. Like you said, you know, the, the sample temperature affects the lifetime that may be used. Like for example, zero degrees Celsius. Is it a modeled one or like, uh, or you have the actual uh, measurement on that? It has a, the actual measurement on that. So if the sample temperature, because the lifetime, uh, it follows the Boltzmann distribution. So e to the power exponential minus C by KT. So if you increase the temperature, the resident time of the trapped electron at, uh, at that trapping center become less. So it is theoretically calculated, but this theoretical calculation is based on the activation energy calculation. So, uh, so that is the thing. So if the samples are kept at zero degrees centigrade, the lifetime is quite high uh, and, and it is very stable signal. But if the temperature is 30 degrees centigrade, it is uh, the lifetime is less, and which is quite expected. Uh, can you tell me if I got it right? Like if you have a very low temperature area, which means that you can have that uh, area dated for a longer period, or is it like that? Or in the sense of the temperature? Yes. So if you talk about in terms of uh, the dating application, if the samples are kept at a, uh, this a zero degree centigrade, so that area, uh, will have a, you can go for higher range uh, or you can say that is a, you can use uh, the lower temperature TL signal to date that sample. But okay. if you want to, if the sample temperature at uh, is kept at 30 degrees centigrade, then you have, you have to use the TL signal, which is insensitive to 30 degrees <coughs> centigrade. That means far right TL signal which right, is yes. insensitive to 30 degrees centigrade. So we so should have a prior... The, what is the temperature of the ambient and what signal that you want to use? Thank you. Oh, there, we have got a question now in the chat box. If you, if you may look at it, what depth? Uh, let us see. Rabbi Yul, if you could read it so that the people in uh, watching you on okay. YouTube can also listen to it, please. Okay. Uh, at what depth are the samples collected uh, so as to avoid the noise or error due to surface erosion? Yeah, this is a very nice um, point. So if the erosion rate is quite high, we have to do the correction. So we take the samples from the uh, surface. And the, in the European Alps, a, uh, the erosion rate is quite low, which is around, uh, uh, around 10 to the power minus three millimeter per year. And in some area that you can see that it's a, it's a glacier, um, there's a, 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 a polished uh, uh, there's a bedrock. And so if the erosion is high, we have to do the correction uh, for that. But we can see that there is a there is study that is a, in a longer kilo year time scale the temperature is up to two meter is uh, two meter depth the temperature is in equilibrium from the uh, atmosphere in a kilo year uh, uh, time scale. However, we take the samples from the surface and we remove the outer layer because it is exposed to sunlight. So outer few centimeter we remove and the interior part, we crush and uh, separate the Felsberg grain and analyze. Is uh, it okay? It is... Okay, that's nice. I hope, uh, uh, I think his question was answered. Any other questions you may ask or else? Yeah, yes, that's nice. He said yes, thanks a lot. Thanks. So we have got two more minutes. So if anyone has any questions, we may ask. Uh, this is also the point that you, Rabul, that you were mentioning about the tectonic stability of the area, right? Uh, the erosion. Yeah. So if it is said there is a highly tectonic uh, active settings, which is the rock has a exhumation or the erosion is high, exhumation and erosion is high, uh, you cannot use that because the geothermal gradient uh, on this uh, overtake that uh, the surface temperature fluctuation uh, is there. So it has to be, the sample should be steady over on the, uh, for the time period that we are looking for. Okay, I think uh, that is, that was a wonderful talk we had. 
uh, it was uh, in a very new and uh, beginning stage of this uh, this way of analysis or this method. So I wish uh, all the best to Rapun to further fine tune on this and uh, have a wonderful uh, career with that. So thank you so much, Rapun, for coming by, and we all enjoyed your talk. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Linda, and all. Thank you, Rapun. That was really interesting. Um, we are now going to move on to our next speaker. Um, our next speaker is Anne Alexander, and uh, she is research director of the French National Center for Scientific Research at uh, CRG, Aix Marseille Université Europol Méditerranée de la Loire. And uh, she's going to talk to us about the triple oxygen isotope composition of phytoliths as a proxy of continental atmospheric humidity. And I'm really looking forward to listening to you, Anne. Thank you. Hello to everyone. Um, Anne, I think that you can share your screen if you have um, a, pre a presentation, a PowerPoint or whatever it is. Okay. Do you have any difficulty in sharing the screen? Anna, are you able to share the screen with us or are you trying? I'm, I'm trying actually. <laughs> um, okay. okay, that's it. Okay. Perfect, we can see it now. Okay, so um, hello to everyone and thank you to the organizing committee for inviting me to present uh, this uh, this talk on the triple oxygen isotope composition of phytoliths and how we can use this as a proxy of continental atmospheric relative humidity. So uh, this is the, the research we've been doing for the last uh, three or four years. And we are a group of uh, scientists uh, from uh, different labs in France and in Canada. Uh, we have several uh, master's students and PhD students in the groups too. And what I'd like to highlight is that we, um, we benefit from uh, uh, very uh, valuable uh, facilities, which are the European Ecotron, uh, which allow us to do some uh, calibration in uh, climate chambers or grow chambers. And uh, we also use the AMACATCH and O3HP uh, observatories. These are uh, ecological and uh, hydrological uh, observatories that are in uh, West Africa, in the south of France, in the, in the Mediterranean uh, area of south of France. So the, this project is, is mainly financed by the, the, the French National Research uh, Agency. Okay, so I can't move it. Okay, so <laughs> fine, thank you. So why is the continental atmospheric relative humidity an interesting climate parameter? Uh, first of all, when you use the relative humidity, you can combine it with the uh, air temperature. And then you can uh, calculate the concentration in water vapor. And the water vapor is the most important gas contributing to the natural greenhouse effect. Then you can also use the relative humidity to calculate what we call the vapor pressure deficit, uh, which is actually the difference between uh, the concentration of vapor in the, in the air and uh, uh, the, the concentration of vapor that the air could hold if saturated. And this vapor pressure deficit is very important because it controls the opening or the closure 
of stomata in the, in the, in the, in the plant leaves. And these stomata allow uh, the transpiration, but they also allow the photosynthesis. And so the, this parameter is very important for the water uh, cycle as well as for the carbon cycle. It's also a very important factor for uh, ecosystems and for predicting how ecosystems are going to evolve. And we really need to know how the relative humidity and the vapor pressure deficit are going to evolve to know how the ecosystem and their interaction with climate uh, are going to evolve. Okay. The problem is that uh, global climate models have difficulties to, to, to predict uh, continental humidity conditions. And here I show a very uh, uh, common uh, figure where you can see how uh, the relative humidity is projected for the future by the intercomparison, uh, uh, the model intercomparison uh, project. And what I'd like you to focus on is the uh, etching, uh, the, the area where you have etchings. So this is, for example, in here in Africa or in the Arabic Peninsula or in India. And this etching means that the, the, the models do not agree with each other. That means the accuracy of the model is not good. And we need to find out why is this. And to enhance the model, we need uh, uh, to, to proceed to model data comparison. And this comparison has to be applicable beyond the instrumental period in order to take advantage of change in, in, uh, in relative humidity in the past. Another problem is that we, we lack of quantitative proxies for this relative humidity. So here uh, is a list of, of uh, isotope proxies that are used up to now to reconstruct uh, uh, humidity. You have, for example, the, the isotope composition of tree rings or the isotope composition of left waxes or the triple oxygen isotope composition of lake water recorded in gypsum or carbonate. This is a very new proxy. The problem with this proxy is that uh, there are often other parameters than relative humidity that impact the, the isotope composition. For tree rings, for example, you have the temperature or you have the, the, the source of the water uh, air masses that uh, impact the isotope composition. For left waxes, you have um, other parameters than climate that impact the isotope composition, such as the, the kind of plants uh, or the preservation of the waxes. And for the uh, gypsum and carbonate isotope composition, for the moment, this proxy can be used only in areas that are very, very evaporative, so very, very dry. Um, so that's why I'm going to, to present how the, the triple oxygen isotope composition of uh, evaporated left water that is recorded in phytolins could be a complementary to this bunch of, of uh, uh, relative humidity proxies. But first of all, I, I need to introduce some terms I'm going to use. So I'm going to be very, uh, I, I try to be very simple. So um, in, in the solar system, you have three uh, stable isotopes of the oxygen. And you can see here that the uh, 17, uh, o, O17, sorry, is uh, the abundance of the O17 is very, very small. That means that we need very, very precise instrument to measure it. Now you have the isotope ratio, which is equal to the uh, less abundant to the most abundant isotopes. And because it's often very, very small, uh, we use the delta notation, which gives the isotope ratio, for example, relatively to the standard. Okay. Now, when you have a, a, um, a reaction from A to B, there is a fractionation and uh, we use the term alpha to name the fractionation factor and it equals the ratio of the isotope ratio of A versus the isotope ratio of B. Now in the triple oxygen isotope system you have this term theta here in, in red that link the uh, fractionation factors 
for the O17 and O16 with the fractionation factors for the O18 and O16. Okay, a last term I need to introduce is the 17O excess. So here you have the delta O17, which is represented relatively to the delta O18. And you see here in green, there is what we call the meteoric water line. That means that all the, sam the meteoric samples uh, lie uh, around this line with a slope of 0.5 to 8. And the 17 OXS is the, uh, depart the delta o o 17 departure from this line here. So this is a 17 OXS. In evaporated water, it's, it's, it is usually uh, negative. So it equals the delta O17 minus 0.5 to 8, the delta O18. Okay. So now when uh, water evaporates, uh, there are different uh, fractionation and processes that occur. And this has been modeled by Craig and Gordon uh, in 1965. And the model has been, has been um, uh, enhanced, but it's still very, very uh, practical to uh, explain what happens when evaporation occur. So you have evaporation from a liquid water here, and it's like you have several layers between the liquid water and the free atmosphere. In the first layer, the vapor is in equilibrium with the water, and so have, you have a, an equilibrium fractionation. Then above it, there is a, a layer where the um, water molecule diffuse in the air. It's called the molecular diffusion layer. And here you have a kinetic fractionation. And then when you go uh, towards the free atmosphere, you have a mixing between the evaporated uh, water and the, the atmosphere. This model allowed to calculate the isotope composition of the evaporated water here. And you can see in this formula that the, the, the main parameter of this uh, isotope composition is the isotope composition of the liquid of the atmosphere, delta A, delta L, and it's H. H is actually the relative humidity. OK. So now when we apply these Craig and Gordon models to the triple oxygen isotope system, it, it, it can be a um, this is the Okay, it can be explained like, like this. So here you have the delta O17 versus the delta O18. So you start from one, from an initial water. Then you have, as I said, an equilibrium fractionation with a slope which is close to the meteoric water line. And then uh, I must say this is a conceptualization. It, it doesn't occur like that. Everything occurs in the same time, but. Uh, um, so you have this fraction, equilibrium fractionation, and then you have this uh, kinetic fractionation. And the extent of this kinetic fractionation depends on relative humidity. It's, the extent is, is, uh, is higher when the relative humidity is lower. And then, uh, as I said, in the third layer, you have a mixing between the evaporated water and the vapor here. So it goes from 3B to 4B or to from 3A to 4A. And you can see that the 17 OXS, which is this, uh, this, um, uh, the, this row, uh, is uh, more negative when the relative humidity is uh, lower. It's less negative when the relative humidity is higher. OK. So. Um, the Craig and Gordon model also allows us to, uh, to, to, to realize that um, when the relative humidity decreases, then the delta O18 will always increase and the 17 OXS here will always uh, decrease. And you have a, a very nice line depend which uh, link the 17 OXS, the delta O18, and the relative humidity. Okay. Now, in, in the nature, the water has, uh, have the following uh, isotope composition. Here you have the 17 OXS versus the delta O18. And you can see that um, all the water, like the, the ice water or the rain water or the surface water are just above uh, zero, but they don't vary a lot in 17 OXS. They are very, very stable. 
And that's really an advantage of, of, of this triple oxygen isotope composition. When you look at this green, green circle, these are the plant water. And you can see that the plant water has a 17 OHZ, which varies a lot. Why? Just because it varies relatively to the variation of the relative humidity. Having that in mind, we also know that uh, in uh, plant leaves, uh, uh, silica polymerization can occur. So here, for example, you have an epidermis of grass, and here you have uh, what we call phytoliths, which are uh, amorphosilica particles in the long cells and in the short cells here. And the silica is very abundant in the epidermis of the, of the, of the leaves. And the epidermis is exactly where the stomata are and where the uh, water evaporation occur in the leaves. The, uh, some silica polymerization can also occur in, in, in the wood and especially in the secondary xylem of the wood here. And in this case, the phytolite polymerize from a water which is not evaporated. I must add that it has been shown that the uh, uh, um, silica polymerize in isotope equilibrium with the water. So the silica then when, when the, the plant die can uh, go to the litter and then to the soil and it can dissolve in the soil, but it can also be translocated into the soil and it can go be exported to the, the sediment where it accumulates and it's commonly used um, the, as a vegetation proxy. So having that in, in mind, our starting hypothesis were the following. If the 17 excess of left water depends on relative humidity, if the phytolite polymerize in uh, isotope equilibrium with the left water, then phytolites should record the dependency of uh, 17 OXS left water to uh, relative humidity. So we should find a relationship between the 17 OXS of phytolite and relative humidity. And if this is found, then we can use uh, fossil phytolites that are in sediment to reconstruct the past variation of relative humidity. So to assess this uh, hypothesis, we uh, calibrate uh, all this from gros chamber and we verified what we obtained from the gros chamber in the field. So that's what I'm going to show uh, uh, today. I must say that the isotope analysis were done in, in or, and uh, are still done in, in, three, uh, in three labs here in France and that the, the analysis is very, very um, tricky. <laughs> and it's very hard to obtain good accuracy and we need good accuracy and good reproducibility to, to, um, to have a, a, a signal that can be interpreted. So the plant water, 17 OXS, is extracted by vacuum distillation and then is analyzed by fluorination and is a, is a top ratio mass spectrometry. And the precision is very good, it's five per meg. So per meg is the per mil of per mil. So it's, it's, it's very small. The water and vapor 17 OXS is measured by, the, by laser analyzer and the precision on the 17 OXS is 10 to 15 per meg. And for phytolites, phytolites are extracted from plants or from soils. Um, and then they are dehydrated under a, a flow of nitrogen, and then they are analyzed with uh, infrared laser fluorination uh, isotope ratio mass spectrometry, and the precision is 10, 15 per meg. Okay, now um, here is the calibration we've done in grow chamber. We use three variables, the relative humidity, the air temperature, and the atmospheric concentration in CO2 in order to mimic present and past climates, okay? So we had a, a grass species also, which is called Festuca arundinacea, that we grew for 14 days. So we had seven experiments by varying the different parameters, and we had always three replicates per experiment. All the water samples, uh, were measured and the isotope composition was were measured and of course phytolites were measured too. So the results are the following. Here you have the 17 OXS versus uh, delta 18. 
Here you have the isotopic composition of the irrigation water, the isotopic composition of the uh, vapor. Here you are in red, you have the isotopic composition that were measured for the left water and here for the phytolite. The blue line is uh, the isotope composition that have been modeled, okay? But the measure one are the, are the red, red uh, dot and, and squares. And what you can see is that you have, we, have we, 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 we got what we expected actually, it's an increase in delta 18 and decrease in 17 excess when the relative humidity here decreased from 80 to 60 and to 40. And this relationship with, rela with relative humidity is imprinted in, in phytolids where you have a decrease of 17 no excess between 80 uh, percent of relative humidity, 60 percent and 40 percent. So there is a relative humidity dependency and this dependency can be modeled quite well. Now, these are the results of the Delta 18 and 17 no excess of left water in gray and of phytolites in, 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 uh, in, um, in, in black, um, relatively to the relative humidity, the air temperature, oops, the relative humidity, the air temperature and the concentration of CO2. And what is shown here is that the, there are insignificant variation of the isotope composition with uh, the partial pressure of CO2 and with the uh, air temperature. Actually, this point is, 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 a, is a methodological problem that I, I could explain further. But so the key parameter here is again the relative humidity. Okay, so the key control uh, on 17 no excess of left water and the 17 no excess of phytolite is as expected, the relative humidity, and we have this, uh, this equation. Now we try to find out if this uh, relationship could be uh, found also in the in natural environments. So we got uh, 57 soil samples that were collected by, by us and by colleagues uh, from uh, very high humidity areas in Central Africa towards very uh, low humidity areas in the Sahelian part of uh, Africa. Uh, for uh, all the, the sampling points, we had the, the climate variable from the uh, CRU. I must say that this uh, relative humidity gradient is also a vegetation gradient and you, 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 you go from a, a, a rainforest to a tall grass savanna and to short grass savanna in Sahelian uh, uh, part. So now these are the, the results. Again, the 17 excess here, the relative humidity here, and the red line here is, is a growth chamber that I, I show you on the previous slides. The points of the uh, humidity transect are here. So you have the savanna in, in orange and the um, wooded savanna in, in green and, and the forest in, in dark green. You can see that the, the points follow the, the relationship that were, were found in, was found in the growth chamber. However, there is a, a very high scattering of this, uh, of this isotope composition and we need to work on that. The scattering might come from um, the 17 or excess of rainfall being different from a part to another or the 17 or excess of the soil water be, that is absorbed by the plants being different or the difference in temperature of the, of the lab versus the temperature of the atmosphere, which is actually a par, an important parameter in the Craig and Gordon model. So in order to check that, we, we used another uh, observatory, so the Amakach Observatory in Benin. And there uh, we, we sampled the uh, rainfall, soil water, uh, grass stems and, and left water and grass stem and left phytolites as well uh, as litter and, and soils. The sampling were done for two kinds of vegetation, a forest and a savanna, and for two uh, kinds of season, the dry season where the relative humidity is low and the rainy season where the relative humidity is high. We had all, all the climate data for the last 10 years. So these are the results. The 17 OXS is expressed versus the Delta 18. 
And what you can see on this uh, uh, top part of the, of the diagram is that the, the rainfall uh, from the rainy season and from um, the beginning and the end of the rainy season uh, doesn't vary a lot in 17 or excess. It's very, very similar from a season to another and from actually from a year to another. The soil waters also here, this is the average and they are very, very, very similar when you, when you sample them at the beginning of the rainy season, in the rainy season, and at the end of the rainy season. So we don't have any variation of the 17 or excess of the water absorbed by the plants. Here is uh, the, the point for, for phytoliths and the square are stem phytoliths and the circle are left phytoliths. And uh, what you can see is that uh, stem phytoliths or rainy season left phytoliths plot together, while dry season left phytoliths here plot together because evaporation is higher, that delta 18 is higher and the 17 or excess is lower. So this is what, what is expected. Something interesting is that when, we, when, when you study the, the phytoliths of the litter, and the litter is going to go to the soil and the soil to the sediments, actually the litter record very well the rainy season uh, phytoliths. So the litter, the soil and the sediment will record the relative humidity, uh, uh, the, I mean the 17 excess of the phytolith of the litter and soil sample and sediment sample will record the, the relative humidity of the rainy season. Now for the same uh, set of, uh, of data, you have here in, in clear um, uh, green the data for the savanna and in dark green data for the, for the forest. And here is again the, the relationship that we obtain for the grow chamber. And you see again that the points are along the, 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 the relationship that there isn't any uh, vegetation dependency uh, the um, relationship is close to the grow chamber relationship, but still we have a scattering which is smaller than for the uh, previous um, uh, data set, but which still exists. And because we want to have an uh, accurate and precise uh, proxy, we need to work on that too. And the idea now is that the scattering may result from the difference of temperature between the left water between the left, sorry, and between the atmosphere. And this is very important. And that's why I won't show you any results here, but our next step, and we are uh, measuring it, is to measure the, the, the temperature at a very dry area here in the southern part of France. So we have an infrared sensor to measure the temperature and, and the average of uh, left temperature for a grass plot. And we are going to uh, measure the difference between the left temperature and the and the atmosphere. Uh, now, um, so so the, the this is where we are in the calibration. We have two equations. The first one, two proxy equation. The first one from the grow chamber here, uh, and a second one from the from the field. The two equations are, are close, but are not exactly similar. However, when you, for example, for a 17 or excess comprised between uh, minus 150 and minus 350, which is usually what is the, the, the range of 17 or excess you find for phytoliths, you can see that for very low 17 or excess, the relative humidity reconstructed is, is very close. So it's less than, than, uh, than, uh, than 6 uh, percent in relative humidity. Uh, it's also uh, closer when you, you deal with uh, 17 or excess of the order of minus 200 or minus 250. The relative humidity which is reconstructed is very low. It's less good when you deal with uh, 17 or excess of minus 150. That means that when you deal with 17 or excess that were acquired uh, for a relative humidity that high. So now in order to, uh, to be more precise for this uh, this uh, range of 17 or excess, uh, we need to uh, compare um, the triple oxygen isotope sig signal that you find in, in leaves and the triple isotope signal that you find in, in trees and in trunk. Because where you have high relative humidity, it's also where you have forest and where you have phytoliths that come from the wood of, uh, of, uh, of trees. So 
we've sampled already um, uh, an area in Senegal for which we also have a lot of uh, climate parameters and the sample are still uh, processed right now. In Senegal, we also sample uh, a, a core from Lac Gears, which is the highest lakes in, in, in Senegal and in, in West Africa, actually. And uh, we are also going to um, study how the riverine vegetation can impact the 17 excess of the uh, wall watershed uh, that produce uh, phytolith that are recorded in the sediments. Um, that's all for now. And I uh, thank you for your attention. I know that it's very late for lots of you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anne. That was really, really interesting. So this is a very exciting uh, new proxy. So still sort of in construction, right? You're still, it's very exciting to hear. Are there any questions in the audience? I'm, I haven't seen any on the YouTube chat. Are there any questions? Brian, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Brian. Has... Hey, Brian. Hey. Um, yeah, I was just, I was curious because you, you show um, a difference between wet and dry season phytolins. Um, and that the litter is much more similar in terms of its 17 excess to the wet season phytolins. How does that work in a fossil sequence? Is the expectation that most of the phytolites you find will be litter-like? Um, yeah. And if so, how, where did the dry season phytolites go? Are they just, are they swamped because there are so much, so there are fewer of them or? So uh, actually in the sediment, in the soil, uh, you, you will record what you see in the litter. And in the litter, most of the phytolites will come from the, the, the rainy season because during the rainy season the biomass is higher and even the, the silicification is higher. Yeah. So it's normal to, to, uh, to find that the, the, the litter um, isotope composition is close to the, to the, to the rainy season one. We still wanted to analyze what um, was uh, the, the isotope uh, composition captured during the dry season because we wanted to check this relationship between the relative humidity and the, and the, and the 17 excess. Yeah, but yeah. mainly in the sediments, you will have a rainy season phytolites. Okay. And so, yeah. Okay, so in, and, and not that it, I mean, it's not like it's a bad thing or anything like that. I just, it's sort of one more thing to, to wrap your head around when you look at a fossil sequence that you are really probably primarily looking at rainy season, growing season, phytolites and variability in relative humidity within that season, yeah. but not necessarily sort of on, on an annual scale. Yeah. So what we are doing now in Benin is trying to correlate the different kind of relative humidity actually. This is a very good question, yeah. So uh -huh. we, we and even in, in relative humidity, you have the relative humidity, which is close to the leaves and the relative humidity, which is uh, usually uh, taken in the atmosphere. And what you have in climate database is uh, the troposphere yeah. uh, relative humidity. So, so we are working on the relationship between the different kind of uh, relative humidity. And yeah, maybe but, within, like within the canopy, I mean, depending on where you're getting your phytolists from, but yeah. if, you're, if you're in a forest, you could expect that you know, the taller trees might be experiencing a, quite a different environment than, you know, undergrowth and that kind of thing as well. Yeah, that's why we have a, a forest and a savanna in, in Benin. And uh, we have a, um, a temperature and relative humidity at two, four, six, so below and above the canopy. And yeah. we, are, we are comparing the different relative humidity. Yeah, that's very, very important. But mainly, uh, uh, um, we are quite sure about that. What we, you are going to find in the sediments will be the, 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 the rainy season. But the rainy season can, be, uh, can have a relative humidity, which is quite uh, viable. Mm. Uh, because uh, sure. I mean, the relative humidity is different at the beginning, at the end, in between. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But uh, to answer your question, yeah, we will have to uh, correlate the rainy season relative humidity with the mean annual average relative humidity. I wonder, I just sorry, I don't want to dominate the questions, but I was just, uh, <laughs> but I'm going to. Um, but uh, I was wondering if 
you know, in, 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 if there were taxa that produced phytoliths specifically in the dry season and you could maybe target those in a fossil sequence and say, ooh, look, there's one of those. Let's collect a bunch of those and measure those and try to get our, our dry signal as separate from our wet signal. I mean, phytoliths being what they are, that might not work so easily. <laughs> but it would be interesting to see maybe. I don't know. You've probably thought about it. Uh, well, actually, you, you, it's going to be difficult to find uh, phytoliths from the dry season just because in dry, during the dry season, you don't have any uh, biomass production. What, um, what did you identify as your dry season ones in that little graph that you showed? Sorry, can you say it again? In, in, in the graph that you showed, you, you showed some dry season ones. How did you identify those? What, what were they? Oh, just because they were, during the dry, dry season, you, you have so, some part of the grasses that still grow. So you, we just okay. collected the green parts. But when you will go to the sediment, the, the humid season will, will dominate. It'll just yeah. look the same. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, but we, yeah. So no, we go are, ahead. We are comp Sorry. Sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead. <laughs> no, 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 you. Okay, so we are comparing a, a dry uh, and a humid, so the, 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 I showed the result for the humid site in Benin, yeah. so we are now in Senegal and we are going to compare um, the 17 OXS obtained during the rainy season, but for annual uh, mean uh, relative humidity, which are very, very different. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I know I mean, it, it's super interesting work. It's really, it's I, I love that kind of you know digging into all of these uh, all of these things. But, uh, yeah. It's exciting, actually. And yeah, I bet. No, absolutely. <laughs> Lots of questions. Yeah, very cool. Um, and I just ask a very basic question. Uh, it's sort of related. I had similar questions to Brian related to what actually you are measuring. You know whether you're measuring in the end in the sediment you're expecting to measure. So you're expected to measure in the sediment more of a wet season uh, relative humidity. No. But I, I was just wondering um, if plant species don't affect uh, that sort of composition, you suggested that they, they don't. Uh, do you see my screen? Yes. Yeah, so I, I didn't show this slide because it's a bit complicated <laughs> to explain. But actually, yeah, of course, we, we thought of that and especially on the, of the morphology of the leaves, on the, how the morphology of the leaves or the length of the leaves and so on, uh, which vary from a species to another, can impact the 17 OXS. So here we, we, we collected the, the stems, the shape, the proximal blade and the apical blade and we measured the water and the phytolites. So here you have the 17 OXS, that's just the delta 18. Here you have the irrigation water and the, the, the isotopic composition of the shade, the, the proximal blade and the apical blade for the water, and that's the same for, for phytolites. And what you, here, the, the, green, the green curve is actually what you can model uh, using the Craig and Gordon model. And uh, with this model, you can show that whatever is the irrigation water uh, here at the end, uh, the isotope composition will always be the same if the relative humidity is the same. Okay. So finally, what we got, what you get from from the from the whole uh, leaf is is a mixing between the shade, the proximal, and the apical blade. And here it's a bulk leaf average and it's going to be always the same whatever is uh, the shape of the leaves or the length of the leaves so that means that it shouldn't change with the grass species and that's the same that, that that's okay for uh, um, left water but that's exactly the same for phytolites too i don't know if i answered your question yes 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 thank you that's really interesting to see actually in the it's very exciting to see this sort of, yeah, this is really the, you know, where our knowledge is at, like the latest, you know, the new proxies is really exciting. Yeah. Thank you. Are there any other questions? I'm just going to check again the, 
No, I don't think there are any questions on YouTube uh, or the chat, actually. Um, Linto, do you have any questions? Uh, not anymore, uh, Angela. I think uh, there is no other questions, yes. Brian? <laughs> oh, okay. I was just thinking about all the ways you could you could sort of apply that to different questions because you know where where we are there's I mean seasonality is sort of such a a major thing um, and I mean even a, a lot of the questions just re relate to I mean what's the primary delta eighteen O driver. And rainfall seasonality is one of the big things that sort of under stratiform clouds and frontal systems associated with winter rain, you're gonna have more depleted 18 and with convective systems, you're gonna have a, a more enriched values. So I was, I was just kind of thinking about all the different ways you could kind of tease that out by looking at biogenic silicas. Um, so, yeah, something very interesting with this proxy, and that's why we started with it, is that uh, you have more than the delta weighting. So yeah. uh, you have the 17 excess, and the 17 excess doesn't vary a lot uh, from rain to rain. It doesn't vary a lot. It doesn't vary a lot when you have a change of phase. So it doesn't vary a lot in the cloud. It doesn't vary a lot when you when the the, the raindrops are, are made and so on. And it's very close even from the most dry area to the more humid area, the variation is, is about 30 per meg. Right. Whereas the variation we have due to evaporation is a lot, a lot higher. So that's why it makes uh, this proxy quite um, interesting yeah, yeah. Uh, because you don't have the same problem as the one you have with a de only delta or you know, even with deuterium excess. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, absolutely, I just, you know, it's kind of a blown away by the potential it's very cool yeah i could see i could see a lot of very interesting applications definitely yeah thank you Anne. that was really really interesting um i'm gonna clap because i didn't clap before thank you so much Anne. uh <laughs> better than an icon thank you, to <laughs> all of you thank you very much it was great to, to talk with you yeah, thank you, Anne. And uh, we so we close the the session for today with this uh, really interesting uh, chat. And I hope you will join us again tomorrow, um, same time uh, tomorrow for four very very interesting talks as well. So I look forward to seeing you all tomorrow. Bye bye. Thank you to the speaker. Yes. Thank, uh, you, thank you, Anthony. Yeah. Yes. Let me take a while to thank you, our um, session chairs, Dr. Angela Gallagher and uh, Dr. Lindo Alapad, who have done a wonderful job and we could complete it on time and we really appreciate that. And I thank all the participants for their active participation. We will be back tomorrow with another interesting session. Until then, it's goodbye from all of us. Thank you. <laughs>